So good morning, everybody. Perhaps you are familiar with me. I'm Leonidas Anthopoulos. Um, I am a full professor at the University of Thessaly. This is uh, in Greece, in the mainland, the third in terms of size and population university in Greece. Mm, perhaps you have read my CV, my research interests concern mainly smart city, smart government and project management. And on behalf of my co-chairs, Professor Marijn Janssen and Professor Vizanth Wirakodi, I would like to welcome you to this year's Web and the City International Workshop. This is the eighth um, version of this workshop, which started back in 2015 in Florence. And every year it takes place in conjunction with this prestigious international conference, the web, uh, the web conference, this is the label of the conference, and uh, run under the ACM. So let me give you just a few figures be before starting. This is the history of our event. We have managed to collect approximately 40 different articles during these eight, these eight years. We have invited nine different keynote speakers to present cutting edge topics in the smart city area. Actually, our workshop tries to um, investigate the role of the web in the smart city context. We have discussed several particular topics like this year's one, which focuses on smart environment. I will discuss with you things about the spatial issue that can be launched right after the workshop. As you may remember, according to this year's call, this is the focus of uh, this year's workshop, the smart environment. And uh, we focus on the different business that appears and utilizes technology in cities in the area of environment and how we can enhance the performance of every city so that we can uh, make them friendlier and healthier for the community. Okay, let me give you uh, the context of our presentations in brief. According to the contributions, to your contributions actually, that have been uh, granted after the peer review process to be included in this year's version, we will go in to see a work that has to do with the human-centric design of smart city technologies. The second uh, presentation will discuss the role of citizens as developers and consumers of smart city services. The third presentation again has to do with human-centered design. Actually, this is a big topic, how we can transform cities to people-centric ones. So people-centricity, citizen-centricity, in terms of service, in terms of technology, uh, is something that attracts the attention. Uh, we are also going to discuss sensor network design for uniquely identifying sources of contamination in water distribution networks. This has to do with uh, water management and its role in a smart city ecosystem. Enhancing crowd flow prediction in various spatial and temporal granularities is the next presentation. A framework to, to enhance smart citizenship in coastal areas is another good, nice presentation, which gives the perspective of uh, the sea and the coastal uh, characteristics of cities. And the last presentation discusses the emergence of multi-tenancy Actually, this is something more technological, which uh, highlights how modern technologies can improve the performance of platforms and the performance of uh, smart city services in its, in its ecosystem. The origins of this year's contributors come from the United States of America, Europe and Asia. These are some figures that would be of your interest. We collected 13 articles in total. Almost half of them have been accepted for this year's presentation. And we have the option either 
to develop uh, a special issue under the ACMD GOV journal, which is free of charge, or to develop a special issue for MDPI sustainability, which has some uh, fees, publication fees, because it's an open access journal. You can take a look at them and discuss and decide which would be of your preference. And next year, since uh, citizen centricity is something that really attracts the attention, perhaps the citizen 50 uh, or society 50 can be a challenge to discuss next year. So I'm giving you the perspective for next year's version of uh, Web and the City, so that we will be able to discuss technology-based and human-centered society in cities. Again, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for your valuable contributions. I hope you will find this, uh, this year's version of your interest too. And we will have the ability to exchange ideas, ask questions to the contributors, and uh, define our future challenges together. Thank you so much. I have, let's say, some bad news. Uh, our keynote speaker had some health issues. I was notified on Thursday that he will not be able to, to be here with us. So we missed the opportunity to, to hear from him some, some interesting things that we have managed to, to discuss together. So I apologize on his behalf, but this is beyond his abilities, everyone's abilities actually. So if you don't have any particular question, then we could start right ahead with the first presentation. I guess we don't. So according to our schedule, the first presentation is from uh, Rob Christiansen and has to do with human-centric design in smart city technologies. Rob, the floor is, the floor is yours. Leo, can you give him uh, the right. appropriate uh, right to make his presentation? Thank you. I will be here with you. Yes, you have uh, all on uh, all on the screen. Yes, no. yes, we can. Okay. Uh, yeah, morning. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Leonidas, for your in introduction. And uh, yeah, it's real fun to be here. Uh, so uh, again, so uh, yeah, my uh, my uh, my uh, yeah talk is uh, about uh, about human centric design and smart city technologies. And it's really the the key issue is really about Rob, common good. Yes. Sorry for interrupting. Just if you don't mind, everyone, since I did not make an introduction of your background. Just in brief, present yourselves to, to the rest of the attendants. Thank you, yes. and ap apologize, Rob, for interrupting. Um, no problem, sorry. Uh, my name is Rob Christians, and I'm a researcher <clears throat> at, uh, at the uh, Technological uh, University in Delft. I am a colleague of Marijn, and I worked there for about 15 years, and my research interest uh, is in the area of, of, um, uh, of normative multi-agent uh, multi systems, uh, and uh, especially the governance and the data quality parts of it. And that's my research uh, agenda for now for 10 years. And this is ongoing research for uh, yeah, um, uh, just uh, get a computational view on controlling really. Uh, it is the, it is the, uh, it is the uh, say the merge of technology and humans, uh, and, and humans and what we coin as social technical systems. So that's my uh, that's my uh, that's my research interest. Uh, next to uh, my uh, research, uh, I am uh, I am self-employed. Uh, yeah, employed. I have uh, one business, and uh, I uh, I, I uh, what I teach at the university, I I also practice. So I work with large companies uh, in the area of uh, smart. Uh, yeah, uh, what what we call a smart. Um, uh, what it, um, uh, Smart spaces, e-mobility, e and the uh, and and the uses of yeah of all these uh, autonomous objects in the real world, and how to how how to how to uh, yeah how how to control them really. 
uh, from a governance perspective, from an internal control perspective, and also from a per performance perspective. So that's that's my background. I live in Amsterdam for now for almost 40 years, and I've uh, I'm still love love it here. So uh, that's really uh, my uh, my background. And uh, for, for today's uh, my paper for the, my today's uh, talk is really about this journey. So I, we are, uh, yeah, I am, uh, I am investigating. So uh, let's uh, start the, again. Human centricity in smart technologies is really the experience that we talk about uh, internal control, about governance, about stakeholder society, about shareholders, whatever. But it's also the key question is when we encounter some new business model or we have, uh, have we have these uh, economical activities, what are the consequences of our acting in the real world? That's really had a key problem and we can come up with some solutions how to cope with them. So please, uh, I must say, uh, I don't have the solution, but just I just I thought about how to how to how to uh, how to proceed in this new area. Um, I just uh, read uh, about society 5.0, it's quality 4.0, uh, whatever. Uh, these these con concepts are really uh, in interesting. So let's let's take the take a start. Um, that's uh, yeah, the key challenge is for uh, smart uh, municipalities and cities, uh, whatever, uh, is the key challenge is to balance the welfare of many interest groups as natural stakeholders and what we call as stakeholders by design. And the natural stakeholders are into uh, the analysis like the environment, like forests, like uh, the natural resources. So. Let's take them. Uh, let's uh, let let let's view them from a uh, yeah, from from a uh, uh, from from a stakeholders perspective perspective from what happens then, uh, and that's uh, really uh, really also my uh, my uh, problem statement. Uh, given the trinity about institutions on one hand, we have markets and we have organizations, um, and the key question I am we all. Is, Every time we ask ourselves is which governance structure minimizes the transaction costs in governing and controlling in the build a service design for organizations similar to a city. So because the smart city is really a concept and what makes something smart. Uh, that's really the key idea. Uh, when we use uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, they are really, uh, really about, it is really about sensors. It is really about IoT. It is really about sharing data knowledge and making uh, things more intelligible so this is my uh, yeah my my problem statement and this research is initialized and inspired by the procurement process of transport services of a care institution here in holland and it was in the year 2020 2021 where we did this uh, this first analysis from Okay, when we have these all these transport services, how can we come up with a model that we have uh, we have the right services for disabled people, but again we also reach our uh, more uh, abstract agenda like the energy transformation. So from 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 uh, gasoline to electric cars and all these type of. Uh, new concepts we can use in uh, in in transporting people goods or whatever so this is uh, the uh, the the uh, yeah the motivation to, of doing that uh, and if we study this problem then we have institutions markets and organizations share the same information problem really yeah information is not a free good yeah? that's all we know uh, there is no accounting measure of aggregate welfare of all stakeholders is certainly true, but we still have to be accountable, responsible, and we report and we do have our evaluations, uh, performance evaluations. So, how do uh, can we come up with another mechanism? The ambiguity of goals itself. Eh? It is just uh, multi uh, You you can uh, if you hear from uh, if we say well, okay, yeah, the climate change is there. We have a green deal, but what are the goals and how ambiguous are they? Yeah? Can we uh, understand them correctly? And there is also, also conflicting goals. Yeah? From, uh, just, uh, these are related, but 
they do you have to take them in account uh, for come up with new governance or whatever structures. And last but not least, the precision in which performance is measured. And that's really a key issue that's not new, that's always there. But with the new technologies, we are able to measure better, better. That's, that's really a key idea. And that's what we are going to use uh, for before performance evaluation. And that's my starting point. <clears throat> But for, before we do that, we have to study the notion of value itself. So if we look at the market or municipalities or smart cities or whatever, uh, always the simple activity of exchanging goods, exchanging services, exchanging thoughts, exchanging whatever, uh, is always the first step in any production or allocation of resources. Uh, if we accept that, um, that's the main theory really, uh, then we can think about the notion of value itself. So how does an economist look at the value as like pricing conditions? Or how does a uh, sociology look at <clears throat> the exchange mechanism? Uh, and that's really about the conception of what is good, proper, desirable way to behave. Now, this line of thought is not new, but it's well, very well studied in the last decades. But we can learn from it. So it is not only, it's not only emerging for different technologies, it's also emerging yeah, a different perspective on a phenomena we are accounting. Uh, now indeed, uh, if we look at these notions, uh, uh, they have some things in common and they might even share some properties, which is of great theoretical, theoretical and practical interest. Uh, regarding the measurement problem as identified of the, by Tyrol. Uh, I like the work of Tyrol, Tyrol really because he sets common goods on the economic agenda. Uh, so that, 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 that's really the key idea. Uh, if we take that as a starting point, then we can look at, uh, at, uh, at exchanging like uh, then, uh, then we can model this. Really. Now we have a market view like exchanges by definition are, are by definition reciprocal in nature and come in a large variety of what we call coin as means like signed contracts, shaking hands, whatever. It is really had as a gift and a get relationship. Formally, we can go, we can model this. Uh, on the left hand side, there is in the paper I have elaborated upon it. You can model it as a basic, basic and understand. Yes, Leon, yes, you raise your hand. You don't change any uh, slide of yours, do you? No. Because oh, no, no, I okay. did. You I just did. say excellent. Just, just to clarify. Sorry, Rob, for the. No, I didn't. Uh, this is uh, I. Uh, you, you have in now in uh, Conolica model market view. Eh? That's what you see now. Eh? Okay. Uh, on on in the slide on the left. There no, is the sorry, Rob. We only see the first, the introduction. This is the slide which appears on the screen. That's why I made this. Uh... Sorry, sorry. I have to stop it then. And I have to. Oh, it's, then I will put it again. Yeah. That's why I made this interruption. My. If you are. You're still. Yes, we can see the first one. Yeah, okay, wait, and I'll start it again, wait. But uh, perhaps you can uh, change the slides on this form and not transform it to... Okay, sorry, sorry. Yes. My, we can, we can my, see now, we can see my it now. My apologies, really, so... Uh, no worries. Now, then I will give a short wrap-up for that. What I talked about was about the municipalities and the uh, key challenge is the build, and it's a build. Then the problem statement I introduced, that was this, uh, that was this slide, and we will share it afterwards. Uh, so uh, the, this, my research was uh, initialized by the inspired by the procurement process of tra transport services. And then I discussed the problem, uh, the information problem uh, that, that like I uh, gave, uh, and more, more, uh, more uh, uh, to be precise, the fourth one, the position in which performance can be measured is really key for all type of governance and control problems, really. So that's a short version of what I told. And then we have the notion of value. So 
we think about the notion of values and then I uh, elaborated upon the economical side, the social side, the anthropological side, whatever. But they, these uh, notions of value share some properties we can learn and we can uh, use uh, for, for, for example, uh, performance measurement. So this is uh, from, from then on. And now I, uh, I started to talk where you interrupted me in this slide. So this one, uh, we can, uh, if, we, if we take this as a, uh, as a uh, grounding principle, then we can model these type of exchange relationship in a very abstract, but a very precise way, in a mathematical, logical way. That's on the left-hand side. That's, I uh, gave in the, uh, in the paper, I gave some specific definitions. But this, this, this process logic, really, uh, where it is, UML, whatever, you can, um, you can translate it in very neat mathematical graphs, uh, like a digraph, as I, uh, as, I, uh, as I worked out in the paper. And with very precise uh, 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 definitions. Why? Because that's the way to, to model precise what should or get measured. Uh, what are we aiming and what is exchange and how do we measure it? And that's the key idea about the paper. So, if we look at the mathematical structural properties, then we see that the formally the bilateral exchange relationship preserves the identity of the objects denoted as rationals. If you have an exchange, we give money for goods. Yeah? Uh, that, that's really, yeah? uh, if I give you a, a smile, you will give me a smile back. Very simple. These are the rationals. And give, with, with these examples, you can think about, oh, everything is exchanged and something is going on there. Uh, if we look at the, on the left hand side, is uh, more formally defined how this di digraph is, is modeled. Uh, perhaps for some who are interested, it's really like a Möbius letter uh, for, for mathematics, but that's the beyond, uh, beyond uh, the, the scope. But the structure models and uh, digraphs the notion of good service of money, whatever, yeah, uh, are in fact dimensionless. Yeah, we haven't defined them. Yeah? What is it? Exchanges uh, about uh, a smile. How do we recognize a smile? Whatever. And so we need a unit of measurement. Now, the unit of measurement you can define them very precisely, and uh, that's what we did in the equation. Just add them to it, and so we give a neat, uh, specific uh, definition, so we can have really have a some you know, unit aware all algebra really that's really what it is the key point is that what we have modeled as a business process we can have a precise mathematical model and we can use it as an information source so and if we uh, have this now this is the market view and this model you can extend it any way you like uh, like supply chains or whatever uh, because if somebody sells something, he has to buy something. That, that, that resources are not from here, no, they are coming somewhere from. So you can exchange this model as long as you want. The identity is still preserved. So we have this value exchange market, and that's a simple. Now we see there the delta. Uh, if the seller and the buyer are the same people, we have a barter, really. And nothing else happens, and then the delta is zero. And that's exactly what is meant. If there are differences, then 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 there are deviations, and that's where the delta is all about, uh, for preserving uh, 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 the, the identity. Really, if I uh, take another uh, next slides, so if you have that, then we we can extend this model and then we have a basic uh, yeah graph uh, which really represents any time of uh, any type of exchange you really want to model formally the bilateral exchange relationship preserves the identity of the objects we recognize the notion of linear negation as a linear logic for computational services and it is easy to see that the delta is only meaningful gives some uh, idea about what, what, what is measured, even if the units of measurements are identical, what is exchanged. So it's yeah, quite simple, but very elementary for if you want to, uh, want to make some calculations or whatever. But this is basically uh, the, uh, the, 
the way to model it. Now, if we go, if we return back to the information problem revisited, we know that the lack of convergence of objectives among stakeholders, externalities, emerge impacting common resource good, uh, resource pools. Externally, externalities are caused by conflicting control rights. Who decides? So, in the case we align the objectives of stakeholders. It is expected that externalities become internalized, preserving the welfare of stakeholders. So if we build them in our business models, then it must be the case that we uh, that, that it becomes our norm also. That, that's the key idea. Consequently, stakeholders must act as stewards, uh, safeguarding the common pool resources. Now, the key question is who and how to organize it. And that's the next uh, question. So we have to, in, from a smart city perspective, we have seven uh, key uh, questions we can, we, we have to answer. I won't list them all, you can read it in the paper. But the most important one is, are the values expressing common pool resources from services subsumed in other values? The answer is yes. And that's really, uh, that's really uh, uh, handy that, uh, for recognizing that. Once we observe what stakeholders have decided, then we are in the circumstance to interpret which views stakeholders hold. We know and don't to know what is valuable. So we need to know the contract. But this information is revealed by contracts stakeholders actually agree upon in exchange relationships. Therefore, the information is decentralized. It's not a central thing. It is not so multi-tenancy or whatever. That's, uh, there's no one big architecture. Uh, there are all type of contracts, uh, just as people are. That's where the human centricity comes in. Really. No doubt that clean air is a common uh, pool resource. Now, customers pay for services as, uh, or goods in some currency. Currency can be money, but currency can also be stones or whatever. Uh, it's just a currency, uh, just an exchange. By ordering a transport service, a customer buys carbon dioxide, which gas impacts the environment, polluting the clean air. Indeed, clean air is subsumed in the payment of taxi services. It's in it. So, carbon dioxide has negative value impacting the positive value, clean air. Clean air refers to the common belief of stakeholders. The value bearer, natural value, is the equality carbon dioxide equals zero. That's our policy, and it needs to be zero because that's really uh, that's what we want. Notice that there's a cl clear link what agents pay for and the common pool resource usage. It can be anything, humans, uh, gas, air, whatever. Uh, that, that's really the key. If we take that in, then we can look at the case. Now, what we did is the, this logic applying in the, for a care institution here in Holland. And this senior management asked themselves, okay, we have this large contract with a, with a transport pro, uh, provider. Um, how uh, that is, uh, uh, they, they wondered what the actual uh, carbon dioxide emissions were at present and what they can do to lower it yeah? and so uh, to contribute to its social goals and what measures the management should take to make the contract of transport services carbon dioxide neutral here by back in 2025. Now on the right hand side we have some key figures and the first two lines is the basically is that the equation number one in the paper that's it that's where it starts it's a very simple thing really everybody can understand it Clean air subsumed in the payment of taxi services. So we made these calculations with the data and then extending equation eight, I've listed it on the left side on, on the bottom. Then you can just add to it a unit and a measurement and some standard. So if we have the carbon dioxide per kilometer and we know all the distances of cars, then we can just have a very simple formula really. And on the right hand side, the right, right hand side, the actual results. The key insight is that with five percent of yeah, replacing 
the original vehicles, see, uh, carbon dioxide's uh, impact is lowered by more than 30% or 40%. So it was very easy to make people very enthusiastic about it. Just, just, just uh, 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 divest in these gasoline-driven uh, uh, vehicles and invest in electric cars. Just five from 50. And then you have the major impact. So people started to like, hey, it's easy, it's fun to have. And that's where the governance part comes in and in control. People like it and they want it. That's really the key notion. And it's a very simple model, very simple impact, but very, but very precise in what is uh, achieved. So we have also a measure of who decides, how do we measure the performance and how can we evaluate it? With a very simple model. Now you can uh, make some uh, creative, uh, all types of processes you can uh, apply this one. And I've done it, but there was no time in the paper, of no room in the paper. As, as a result, four dimensions are important to determine the form of control being the most efficient one. A first, second, and third, you read it. What is very uh, important that the first two dimensions, like clarity and the ability to measure the output, uh, is uh, is really uh, uh, is really the key information problem. So the information problem emerges when the object, what is exchanged between two parties, is not considered in the unit of analysis, and that's really the key point. If we do that, then we can say something about in which way to control and allocate decision rights. Central, decentral, autonomous, whatever. Yeah? But that's, these, are, these are really uh, yeah, in the ecosystem itself and the circumstances yeah, we will do. But we have an aggregate to compare everything, whatever, but we, because the unit of analysis is precisely defined. So that's really the key idea. And then we have this aggregate measure, whatever, yeah, whether it is welfare, I really don't know, but I know that it impacts on society. That's the real people. That's my last slide. Yeah, for information, we use the mathematical model to determine the minimum amount of data as attributed in the database. And that's really what we did. That's the linkage. Yeah, and these insights minimize the governance and control risk because it was very easy. Yeah, or uh, now having a clear ambition, a clear view is actual performance and the sufficient design. So um, remark, <clears throat> the role of a municipality or a government, smart city, whatever, is to use the contractual apparatus in order to reduce the externalities imposed by this controlling stakeholder by extending the contractual apparatus with legal and regulatory stipulations to protect the welfare of non-controlling stakeholders. So we have boundaries. We need to have boundaries and within the boundaries, you can be creative, whatever. I don't prescribe, but yeah, uh, make uh, make uh, 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 yeah, what it, uh, uh, companies enthusiastic about these initiatives. That's really the issue. And that was my last one, uh, Leonidas. Thank you. I think I did the right time. Thank you so much, Rob. It was a full presentation and a full explanation of the insights of your work. Uh, so we have a couple of minutes for discussion, for questions. I think Helena asked for the floor. Is that correct, Helena? Or it was just a congratulations, a clapping. <laughs> All right. So you managed to model, to create models, to depict values coming from different sources. This is really interesting. You used cases that deal with environmental issues so this is really something in my understanding very useful because you can you will be able to calculate values from uh, coming up from different sources and not only monetary values That's indeed the key point. Uh, since i can't see any of the co any of our colleagues trying to ask something i have a question for you rob did you manage to calculate values coming from other sources too except the ones about mobility 
Yes, we did uh, we did uh, did this I did this the same analysis also uh, for the uh, municipality of Amsterdam itself, and that's uh, not only uh, public transport, but also consequential about the uh, the infrastructure, about uh, energy and about health and uh, and also spaces. So when we preserve the identity, there was this uh, have this human. Uh, what we call it is just a citizen of some uh, municipality. And he is served in, uh, he has a portfolio of services from, uh, from the municipality. We did exactly the same analysis, but then from, uh, from, uh, for, for schooling, for the social, uh, uh, social, uh, uh, whatever. So, we actually also used in the social domain uh, for where there's other planning issues or other quality issues. But the line of reasoning is the same. The only the attributes we uh, we have to be that, that we can do. But we could also uh, uh, so, uh, make linkages between the transport and, uh, for example, the services at some local institution, and then from that. So we could follow. And every, uh, when we have transport, then we have, for example, some treatment and the treatment uh, was in a surroundings A, B, C, D. So we could make this, yeah, this model uh, all day. So, and that's what we do. And then you get this idea about consistency, about perception, and where were people actually were and who was involved at that moment when something was done very well or very well all these situations was unhealthy so we uh, we just uh, were able to locate uh, the patient or whatever is here and here and here and this happened so then and we have different sources again so in space we have this uh, iot platform with all the sensor data and we have external data for whatever and then it's always yeah it's always relating to each other it's like a knowledge graph really and then we have deviations from expectations and that's really interesting. but they are very local so there is a yeah about optimum there are maybe thousands of optimums whatever eh? we don't know and that's what's characteristic for ecosystem really so this is what we uh, do do yeah and then we can if we can reason about it then we can automate it that's the linkage to the linear logic part that's the computational part of how to put it in smart technology like AI, even data driven solutions. But that's not only machine learning, it is about symbolic, uh, you know, symbolic reasoning, really. And then come up with the distributions. That's my next, uh, that's my next uh, dream, I would say, so to formulate it further. Actually, this will be this would be one of my questions. What are the future steps of this work? And I was wondering, Rome, if you have considered an association with the usual or let's say the well-known KPIs coming either from standards or from the United Nations SDGs, and if you have thought something about them. Yes. We, uh, in our lectures, uh, for example, uh, in the company reporting, there is a large uh, a large body of what should be reported really and the technical uh, technology technical com work, uh, committees for example at the irs or un or whatever they come up with these metrics but then we can say something about these metrics hey where to find them are you measuring them in the proper way so that's really the big research uh, challenge within auditing controlling and that so forth so that's really the these discussions we have uh, i have and that's my colleagues at the free university. So we have the standards and we are, yeah, um, yeah, uh, think about, but that's really a compliance part and controlling and compliance is something different if you have to do, but there is a large risk really, because if you, uh, what, uh, what you measure is what you get. And if you have two simple metrics on a high level, that is institutionalized, information gets lost and that's really the uh, key message of uchi yeah, for 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 evaluation the the performance then that will not be enough 
Let's, let me put it in that way. Yeah. So we have to add on, and then we have this integrated thinking, and that's really a large, uh, a large open uh, question, really. So uh, that's uh, that's my concern a bit. Uh, and this type of research I do with uh, uh, in, uh, at the Free University, with also with Atos, uh, uh, Atos Origin, that's an international uh, big uh, IT company. And then we have the solution smart spaces, auditing issues, and how to model them really. So that's uh, that's my answer to you. This is how we uh, use our knowledge. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much, with, Rob. With with my right. Absolutely, I know that he works in uh, in this domain too, and this is really useful. Um, any other questions from the participants? Suggestions, ideas. Please. What did I do wrong? <laughs> no, nothing. Nothing was wrong, actually. <laughs> Any, everything was fine, Rob. Just you have to think and vote of the uh, which special issue you prefer to to consider. All right, and tell us in the end of the workshop. Great. I will. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Thank you very much. Then, I think we can proceed with uh, our next presentation. I was wondering if the participants would have a problem. I have a request from Ioannis Nicolaou to, to switch his presentation because he has a meeting later. Alexandra, would you have a problem if yes. you present right after? Yeah. Um, yes, a bit. <laughs> In 20 minutes, actually. Yes. Would that be so okay with you? Um, in 20 minutes to present? Yes. Ideally not, if not else possible, yes. Thank you so much, Alexander. So, Ioannis, you have the floor. Uh, good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can, we can't see you. Uh, no, you shouldn't. Yeah, hello. So let me quickly share my screen. You should be able to see the presentation now. Yes, we can see your slides. Great. So let's make a brief introduction of yourself before starting. Sure. So my name is Ioannis Nicolaou. I'm a PhD candidate in the University of Thessaly. I'm involved primarily in uh, investigating blockchain technologies and smart cities and in this paper we are discussing the applicability of the multi-tenancy architecture pattern in smart city platforms so the multi-tenancy as a software architecture pattern emerged primarily in the 1990s and it was an evolution of the service-oriented architecture that was developed during this time in an effort to attack the problem of the big monolithic software that was developed, which were very, which were very hard to maintain, uh, implement and change. So this pattern favored the breakdown of an application to smaller decoupled services that were loosely coupled. And for deployment, they were using primarily an application container, which back then had a different meaning than it has today, which facilitated the life cycle of the services, mainly starting and stopping, providing common um, cross-cutting concerns like logging or security. And this way, attempting to make it easier to develop and maintain an application. So essentially, instead of having a big monolith deployed uh, at the, at the system, you had a container containing all the services. Now, the, this approach brought the idea of, and remember back then, the cloud had not taken off as, as we have seen today, and most of the applications were installed on-premises, so practically every client, every, every enterprise had its own deployment. So one of the ideas that emerged as the cloud was evolving, or basically as the data center or the as a service pattern was evolving was how could we leverage this to reduce the costs and the idea was 
especially in the SMEs or the small and medium enterprise market, that if we have an application that has pretty much the same functionality and uh, all the users use pretty much the same things, why not having a central application serving all of them instead of uh, each one having a dedicated one? And this had a lot of many benefits, primarily the lower cost of operations because the vendors, instead of maintaining tens or hundreds of applications, they just had a few of them. And this accommodated a very large number of customers and also a high utilization of resources, especially in the case where the applications were not really uh, CPU or memory intensive. Uh, instead of having hundreds of applications deployed in servers that were pretty much idling, you would use a, a centralized uh, farm of servers that would serve a lot of users, and this way you would have a high utilization of your hardware resources. But this pattern had significant challenges uh, that appeared, and all of them had to do with isolation. So the, the primary concern was the security isolation between the tenants of the application. Remember, you now have, instead of having its customer having its separate deployment, you have a centralized server that serves all the customers. So there were concerns regarding the segregation of security between the customers. So how, for example, can we be sure that the customer data are not mixed between customers or later on when the DTPR, for example, came into, into the picture, how can we remove all the data from a customer when they want to leave the, the multi-tenant uh, deployment, including their logs or any other information that is stored centrally. Also, performance isolation was an issue. Uh, for example, what happens if one of the tenants misbehaves and consumes disproportionate number of resources and how could we ensure the SLA across all customers? Availability isolation in the sense that if a customer, for example, wants an update for a new feature, uh, whereas another customer does not, how can we ensure that the, form, the, the former will get the update, whereas the latter will not uh, suffer any downtime? And finally, the application customization. So if a customer wants a different view or either in the user interface or in the operational aspect of the application, what would happen if um, these changes were required and the other customers would not, would not want this. Now, if we switch to the smart city uh, platforms, so essentially a software application that serves the, the needs of the smart city, the needs there are uh, slightly different in the sense that these platforms um, have to support scalability, but not from day one. Usually they, they start as a small experiment or as a proof of concept and they grow as the smart city needs are, are growing. Uh, also, these platforms need a high degree of flexibility to integrate with different systems, uh, services, data sources. This includes, of course, the myriad of sensors that may be available, which are different between cities or applications. And of course, they need to be able to provide information to other data, to other parties, uh, in the sense of uh, acting as a, as a layer or as the fabric of communicating between the businesses running the smart cities and the data that are collected from the sensors. And finally, these platforms need to be very flexible and adaptable to the particular needs of each city, because it's not a given that the needs of one city match the needs of another. So the, the multi-tenancy assumptions, uh, which primarily are that the size of its customer is very small to justify a dedicated deployment, and also that the needs of its customer are pretty much the same, does not seem to align a lot with the smart city platform expectations. Because, of course, a smart city cannot be considered equivalent to a small or medium enterprise. Even, even a small village can have hundreds or uh, even thousands of sensors, depending on, on what they want to measure. And also the needs of a smart city are high, highly heterogeneous. So there is the assumption that all of them will want pretty much the same. is not really easy to justify in practice. So in, in this sense, perhaps a better approach to the smart city platform architecture would be to move to the single instance software architecture instead of a multi-tenant one. And of course, the 
many would say, but that would have uh, significant costs, or why did we do this in the past anyway? And the main reason is that in the 1990s or even in the early 2000s, we didn't have the tools that uh, would be needed to support this type of architecture. And today, in the 2020, the, the key enablers that allow this type of architecture to be economically viable are the ones that were developed actually as the cloud was evolving. So the containerization in the modern sense that you have a, a container that contains the software and can be easily deployed in different infrastructures with a few easy steps, uh, primarily using Docker or other container technologies. The automation of the infrastructure itself, so it's no longer required to have people doing the uh, preparation of the virtual machines, the networks, or the configuration of the infrastructure, but you can automate this using scripts and also technology that has evolved uh, that does specifically that, for example, Terraform. Um, the on-demand resource allocation, so the cloud has really uh, achieved to, to provide us uh, resources that can be considered infinite in quotes so the the automation or the its application can request exactly the amount of resources they need starting from a very small one like a half a half a core and a few megabytes of ram up to a full cluster of thousands of cpus and gigabytes of ram and this can be allocated in a matter of minutes and also the cloud native services with by cloud native uh, we refer to the services that are provided by cloud providers that themselves are multi-tenant but from the perspective of the users are completely isolated so they can provide the basic infrastructure and the common uh, services needed for the platform and then have its specific business part of the application being single instance so in in a simple diagram this would be a kind of a hybrid smart city platform architecture. So essentially, here we have four at the top of the diagram, four single instance applications for four different smart cities <clears throat> that are completely independent of each other and can evolve as, as they like in terms of scalability or configuration or um, customization. But all of them use a shared multi-tenant native layer from the cloud uh, from a cloud provider that would be the database a messaging bus for exchange messages or the storage itself but as the city grows and if they want to have complete control of the of their data and of their uh, infrastructure they can very easily switch to the dedicated singleton and deployment where essentially everything is contained for for the specific smart city so that was the um, the basic idea of this of this paper. Of course, as a further research, we consider it important to review this in practice and see what is the state of the art in the currently available commercial smart city platforms. Do they follow this pattern or are they still using the multi-tenant approach? And if yes, evaluate if this multi-tenancy really um, contributes to their success as a as an application for smart cities, or if the uh, identified challenges actually do not allow them and, and cause problems. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Ioannis, for your presentation. I if think you it mind, was on time. Uh, yes, you were. Absolutely, mm -hmm. no worries. I would like to ask the participants if they have any particular questions for you? This is a novel approach. Johannes, do you know? Are you familiar of uh, any installation that follows the multi-tenancy, and uh, this would actually, be useful for the people to understand? Actually, from my works? experience, um, most of the smart city platforms list multi-tenancy as their fit among their features. And my personal opinion is that this comes as, a, as an evolutionary uh, step from, uh, for, for, their deploy, for their implementation, if you like, or for, for the, from the architecture perspective, because most of these platforms 
use patterns and technology that has been around for decades. And in this sense, it's the natural, <clears throat> if, you, if you like, the natural step to provide multi-tenancy. Uh, but this is exactly the point of this paper. In the smart city, our opinion is that this natural uh, step is not is no longer natural. So we should make a paradigm shift and think of its smart city as an independent organization instead of something that we can accommodate along with others on the same platform. And this actually, sure. and this is discussed in the paper, uh, has uh, other more, if you like, more technical issues with it, uh, primarily because a multi-tenant software is much more complex than a single tenant one. So a lot of effort is, is spent and also a lot of risk is uh, is also uh, is also there because if the software is more complicated it's more easy for bugs to sneak in or uh, new features are harder to implement and slower to implement and this hinders the evolution of the of the platform for the smart city but just by the fact that it supports the multi-tenancy whereas in practice our opinion is that it's not practically used. So to make it, to, to say it more simply, even if this is a feature of the platform, we would be surprised if the smart cities would actually uh, allow them to be hosted along with other smart cities on the same, on the same multi-tenant system. Most of them would say, great, you have this feature, but we want our dedicated one. I understand. Rob, please go ahead, ask you your are. question. Yeah, yeah, Wanda. So I, I, that was indeed what, what you said, eh? that uh, you have, uh, cities have their own, they have their own wants, they have their own uh, features, they want their own uh, identity, whatever. Uh, did you consider a multi uh, instance architecture? So uh, you have the multi tenancy, but you have also the multi instance architecture. So we have a digital twin and we have this uh, deployment of everybody, his, uh, this conference, uh, uh, you can, you can, uh, uh, configure your uh, your implementation or your version of it, but the backbone uh, is still the same. Uh, the, still the same software, like a digital twin type uh, of art. Co correct, and <clears throat> actually, the the single instance that we are discussing in the paper is if you deploy it multiple times, is the multi instance pattern. Mm -hmm. We also uh, present it in the paper. And the the idea is exactly as you as you described it that the the main backbone of the platform remains the same, but is deployed in a in a single instance way. So yes. when you have a lot of them, then you have the multi instance pattern, obviously. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you both. Thank you, Rob. Any other questions for Ioannis? Okay. Thank you, Ioannis. Thank kindly you. give us the floor back so that we can continue of with course. our next presentation. According to the schedule, our next presenter is uh, Alexander Wall. Alexander, are you here with us? Yes, I'm here and I hope you can hear Excellent. me Excellent. Johannes, give us the floor, stop sharing. Thank you so much. So Alexander, you have the floor and you can start presenting your work. Okay, let me just remove this one. All right, um, thank you very much for the nice introduction. And I also want to welcome everyone to the eighth International Smart City Workshop. My name is Alexander Feltz. I'm a PhD student and I'm going to present to you the paper Citizens as Developers and Consumers of Smart City Services, a Drone to a Bad Case. This paper was authored by my colleagues, Christian Nook, Daniel Amlashi, Professor Dimitris Karigianis, and myself, and we are all part of the Department of Knowledge Engineering located at the University of Vienna. And at this point, I just briefly want to mention um, the Open Model Initiative Laboratory, or short OMILAB, uh, which has become a global community that engages with conceptual modeling since it was founded in 2011 by Professor Karigianis. And some of you might ask now what we as a conceptual modeling community do. And that can be very nicely summarized with just one sentence. So we as a community use abstraction to reduce complexity in a domain for a specific purpose. And exactly this sentence I also want to use now to motivate our paper because what does this sentence exactly mean? 
we can go through it step by step. First up, we have here the use of abstraction. And in our case, we use models or conceptual models where we abstract away all unnecessary part of a system and just um, remain with the really necessary ones. Um, this is our use of abstraction. And the aim of that is to reduce the complexity in a certain domain. And in our case, we are here, as you might guess, in the smart city domain or the smart tourism domain. And every abstraction also has to have a specific purpose. And in our case, the specific purpose, why we want to reduce the complexity in the smart city domain, is that we want to enable citizen development. And for all of you who don't know, I quickly want to explain this concept of citizen development, because it originates actually from the system, uh, from shadow IT systems. And that is like that companies lost control about the applications that were used within their companies because there were a lot of work around um, applications present that they had no control over anymore. And for that reason, so-called low-code or no-code platforms were developed um, so that these employees could implement them internally within the company with little to no programming skills. And then the company could implement um, these applications and gain this control back. And exactly this concept we also adapted to the um, smart city settings. So what we want to do is enable citizen without um, software engineering or coding knowledge to be able to develop smart city services that help solve problems. Okay, this so far as a setting for the motivation why we actually did this. And from that point, what we have from this slide, what the only thing that you shall take <laughs> is that we used models to reduce the complexity in the smart city domain for the purpose of enabling citizen development. All right, after this uh, motivation, I want to jump right into our introduction. And for that, we took this graph from our world in data.org which shows the number of people living in urban and rural areas. So I guess this is not new to most of you, but since approximately 2007, we reached an urbanization rate from above 50%, which means more people in the world are living in urban areas than in rural areas. And this urbanization rate is projected to rise even above 65% by 2050. Uh. Why is this relevant for us? Well, um, along with such a steady population growth for the growing cities also come new and complex challenges. We already heard quite some of them in the previous talks. So transportation, sustainable resource management, citizen engagement, all of these are challenges that the new um, growing cities face. And one of the possible solutions is utilizing technological advances. And as you all probably know, these are grouped um, under the term smart city such approaches. And our approach now, as I tried to explain to you on the previous slide, wants to enable citizen development to tackle such challenges and that are coming up with problem-based solutions. And the keyword <clears throat> that we want to establish here is citizen development. Okay, after that, we can jump right into our understanding of a smart city, just because there's so many different definitions available in the literature, we wanted to establish one that in our opinion suits um, our case best. And that is a smart city is a city seeking to address public issues. So our problems that are identified in the city via ICT based solutions on the basis of multi stakeholder municipality based partnership. So we um, intend here to have a partnership between city administration and the citizens, as you might have already thought. Then we come to our reusable smart city capabilities, which basically makes up the core of our paper. And for that, I quickly want to introduce two concepts to you um, without explaining them in detail, but rather give an overview why they're important in the context of our paper. So microservices, we already heard, um, is an alternative to the traditional monolith architecture in which we can make up an application of individual and independent services. And the same approach we took within our we took within our smart city setting. So we separated um, the respective smart city capabilities and decoupled services. So what is the advantage of that? You can read them here on the slide. We can offer services independently, and especially we can reuse the already existing ones, and then combine them to create new services. <clears throat> Sorry. This is one of our essential concept um, concepts in the paper. And the second one I already tried to introduce in the motivation are our conceptual modeling message. And we use them to describe the aspect of a system under study. And the important part here is in such a way that we can understand it as humans, but they are also understandable by machine, so they can be processed. 
And in this way, we can exchange knowledge within our system. And then um, as a result, the combination of our models with microservice through that we can enable the citizen development. So um, the development of city services without the need for high sophisticated software engineering skills. Okay, this was now a lot of talking to set up the theoretical background. I hope so far everything is clear because now we can jump right into our scenarios that we thought of. And these are two. Um, the first one would be the tour creation scenario. So we have to imagine a citizen within a city and this citizen comes up with an idea for a city route that he wants to create. Maybe some of the attraction that he likes the most or she um, is not represented well in city tours that are present in the, city, uh, in the city. So he wants to develop one on his own, but he has no software engineering skills or something comparable. And therefore the question is, what can we do? And what we want to provide this citizen with is a so-called microservice configuration environment for our developer. And this is now in respect to what I explained to you on the previous slide. So we have here decoupled city services. Each of these tiles represents one service. Um, as you can see, for example, the drone interface, or we have a routing service. And the citizen can use these without any software engineering skills, combine them, and with that, develop the city tool that he wants to develop. So by just using this platform, our citizen becomes what we understand as a citizen developer. And the last step to do in this scenario would then, need, um, would then be that the citizen developer has to add his tour to the city tour library of the respective city. And then our second scenario that you have to imagine is our tourist that is in a city and he has a similar idea. He wants to take an extraordinary route, not design it, but take it. And what are his um, possibilities now? Well, he just needs the respective application <clears throat> where all our city tours are saved. And then he can, for example, select the tour that was just created by our citizen developer. And the last thing to do in this scenario would then be to go to a drone pickup station, select a drone, and this drone will then guide our tourists on the city tour that he selected. Okay, I hope that made our whole setting a bit more clear. And now I want to go into more detail about our model-based domain-specific services that are enabled through microservice orchestration. And for that, we, as a very first thing, take a look at our entities present in our approach, which are um, usually the same entities present in most of the smart city approaches, which is the human, the technology, and the environment. But based on what I explained to you in the motivation and regarding citizen development, we distinguish here, so these parts, I'm sorry, we already heard about, um, we distinguish between the human um, for once as a citizen as consumer and then as well as a citizen as a developer. So these three, two different instantiations of the human um, that are possible within our approach. In a rather general um, visualization that would look like this, this is our interdependence model of um, the entities unspecialized to our case. So here we have the human, which can interact with our smart city environment, either as a consumer or as a developer. And the smart city itself is made up by its environment and by the respective technology that are relevant. And these communicate with each other to education and sending interactions. This was the rather general one, but now let's come to our specific case that I just presented to you. Um, so our drone tour guide instantiation of our instant interdependence model. And what we can see here that our human is now instantiated to two different in instances. So we have our tourist and we have our tour guide um, creator in accordance with the scenarios that I just presented to you previously. And our environment has now turned into tourist attractions because this is the main aspect of the environment we are interested in and our technology is a drone, as you might have guessed, so. Okay, um, so what is the essence of our model-based city services? The same, basically, as I already tried to explain to you on the theoretical background slides about our microservices, because this microservice architecture that we are using um, enables the encapsulation of all of our services, and by that, we can reuse the already existing microservices over and over again. And quickly, I just want to mention some requirements due to the scope of the paper. We didn't go into a lot of detail about them and rather assume that they are given, um, but still they just have to be mentioned. So we need a modeling tool for our models. We need respective drone capabilities like 
natural language processing for communication on also um, sensors like weather sensors and so on. Then we need our connected infrastructure in which an information exchange is possible. And then we also need our microservice platform that um, I showed you on the previous slide. Good, um, a lot of information about of our case. And now we finally come to our conceptual proof of concept, which um, we did in a form of a three layer component architecture. And this one I want to use now as a summary um, of what our approach is actually about. And let's go through all the individual layers that we have here. So on the bottom, we have the usage layer that I I think I talked about enough by now. So you can see here, we have the consumer interaction with uh, the city environment. This can be, I mean, with a drone, but for sure it's also adaptable to any other scenario you would like to. And then we have our developer interaction, which interacts with our configuration environment um, on the execution layer. So our configuration environment, I also showed you, and this is based on Olive. Olive is also one of the projects from the OmiLab and is um, an abbreviation for OmiLab Integrated Virtual Environment. And we need this OmiLab as a microservice, uh, the Olive, um, sorry, framework as our microservice framework. So this is where all our microservices are implemented in. And these microservices use the models on the design layer, as you can see up here. These are either general purpose models. I mean, it might be a bit tiny here, but as you can see, this one is our traffic services. It doesn't need to be specific to our use case of the drone um, tour guide gate. So we can also use them in different use cases, or we have our domain specific models here as for example, our drone interface. So this is specific and can probably not be reused outside of our use case, but still reused with it. So yeah, um, the service, for example, accesses this model and the services we saw here also use the models on our design layer. And lastly, to sum up this complete um, conceptual proof of concept is our um, execution environment, which is necessary as well. So we, as an example, used here um, ABS as our execution environment because it must be available to execute and manage our services. So all of this basically our wrapper and then we still need the execution of these services in the background and that is done in the execution um, environment. And from here we can also control um, from all of we can also control um, these services. Okay. I hope um, this proof of concept was clear enough to you with all the um, previous knowledge I provided you with. If not, we can always surely come back to this slide, but as a last thing, I then want to come to our conclusion um, for which we conducted a quick SWOT analysis. So what are the strengths of our approach? I hope I made it very clear that it is the reusability of the services and therefore to enable the citizen development with little to no coding skills. We have the adaptability. So because our um, coupling of the models is um, based on loose coupling, it would actually be very easy. Let's assume that a new drone type or so is developed that is exchanged in the city. In the city, That would be very easy to adapt our approach to that. What are the weaknesses? Well, we have the requirements that I mentioned that we assume to be in place, but for sure um, in future research, um, these should also be a major concern of ours. And the real world complete implementation as for now, we only implemented most parts of the um, proof of concept that you saw individually, but the whole package of a real world implementation is also something left for our future research. The opportunities is definitely the openness of the model uh, of our approach that um, yeah, is also the mantra of the OmiLab and our low code principle. So the possibilities to foster citizen engagement and citizen participation here. Um, administer support um, could be expected for such a service if it is implemented on a city level. And that could in the long term hopefully lead also to a monetary compensation for our citizen developers for the service that they're doing, maybe a usage based monetization, but this has not been discussed in detail our paper yet. 
And finally, we come to the threats. So due to the openness of our approach, for sure, we have to consider the possible cyber attack threats. And lastly, if there are um, some of the requirements are not fulfilled, for example, if we have infrastructure deficits, for sure, that would be one of the biggest threats, but also if there is a lack of awareness among citizens about the existence of our service. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any question that came up. Thank you so much, Alexander. I don't know if any of the participants have questions for you. In my understanding, your approach looks like the IFTT, you know, this, uh, this platform in digital business and marketing, where you combine microservices like connecting Twitter with Facebook events. Uh, yes, you know this platform, right? Yeah, definitely heard about it. Yeah, I can definitely see where your um, idea behind that comes from. But yeah, this was definitely not, let's say, our role model to base it on. <laughs> Yes, just, you know, uh, what it reminds me. I don't know if you have uh, considered limitations coming up from the, inter the integration between microservices and the physical environment. For instance, if you imagine the same platform to be launched in other cities, maybe some limitations comes from, come from the uh obstacles that the physical environment brings to the availability of services and the, with the, to the combinations i don't know if you have thought of, of yes, this particular I mean, aspect and definitely we have thought about it let's say we haven't um, elaborated on it until the very end in detail because as i tried to mention we have certain requirements that for now we just assume as given but we are definitely aware of the fact if this would need to be implemented in real life, that there are a lot of challenges coming along with it that need to be discussed in more detail. So to answer your question short, yes, we definitely considered it. Um, no, it is not included in the paper yet. And uh, if you have thought of uh, an initial installation of your solution, where will that be? Because um, it's, it's really interesting and challenging. The, you mean the whole thing, we cannot install it, let's say in just one way, but I mean, we mm -hmm. have our different um, components that we use, for example, the Arduino XX meta modeling platform, then we have Olive for our microservices and the whole context that we would implement that in is definitely, let's say our OmiLab um, that we have here at the University of Vienna. So our physical space where we actually, which we use for implementing these experiments, different, different use cases. And one of the next steps then would definitely be to implement this whole approach within our OmiLab physically. Hopefully in a future event, we will see the updates of your approach, Alexander. I would be very happy. Great then. Any other questions from, uh, from the audience? Excellent then. I think we can proceed with our uh, last presentation for this first, first session coming up from uh, Helena. Helena Blea, the, if I pronounce it uh, correctly, the floor is yours. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Leia. Yeah, um, I um, try to share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Okay. Yes, we can. Please go yes, ahead. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our presentation. Um, Sarah uh, Neumann and I would like to do the presentation together. So I think um, perhaps you can also um, yeah, introduce uh, ourselves briefly. Uh, my name is Gelena Bleja and I work as a research assistant uh, at the Dortmund University and, um, of Applied Science and Arts in the Smart Care Service Project. And I am currently doing my PhD thesis. Um, I'm there. I'm working on um, methods of uh, cooperative game theory for the fair um, allocation of efficiency gains in innovation networks. And um, yes, Sarah, would you also like to um, 
introduce yourself briefly. Yes, um, I'm Sarah and I'm also a research assistant at the University of Applied Sciences uh, and Arts Dortmund in the project Smart Care Service. And um, from my background, I'm a social pedagogue and a social scientist, and I'm preparing to start my thesis as well um, this year in the smart city environment. Okay. Yes, uh, we would like to give you a little insights into our research findings. Um, we are currently um, using a human-centered design approach to develop a holistic care platform and want to gain insights into the different aspects of a business model. And um, we believe it is a very um, interesting and important topic because despite high potential assessment and human care platforms, um, none has yet been able to successfully establish themselves in the market. So, um, okay, yes. Um, we have divided the presentation into five parts. I will start with so a short motivation for this topic. Next, I will move on um, to the methodology and then Sarah will present our findings and the needs and the business models. And finally, we will end with a short resume and further works. So, so I will start with the motivation for this topic. Um, urban development is, a face, uh, is facing major challenges in Germany. Um, demographic change, for example, is a major challenge for our society. An increasing share of the population needs long-time care and care achievements. This leads on the one hand to financial restrictions and on the other hand to supply side obstacles. The nursing and social consequential costs are increasing and um, there's a lack of privileged nursing staff. So solution concepts are needed to efficiently distribute the limited resources in the health and care sector. And there's also uh, the challenge of digitalization for urban development. And in this context, the main aim for smart cities is to improve the quality of life for the citizens through the use of new technologies. And in smart cities, innovative, uh, innovation and communication technologies are used to facilitate and optimize the exchange between um, the various stakeholders in the city. Um, for example, uh, authorities, companies, citizens, and organizations. And the key idea is to make traditional networks and services in various areas more efficient through digitalization and to supplement them with additional aspects. And um, in this context, um, a holistic care platform could help to minimize bottlenecks in care staff uh, through the efficient use of resources. And with the help of um, such a platform, um, people with needs of assistance could be brought together with available providers in their vicinity in a timely and flexible manner. So people could remain in their own homes for longer by combining professional and service providers in addition to a network um, of family members, friends, and neighbors, for example. And as part of the Smart Care Service uh, project, uh, funded by the EU and the state of Northern Westphalia, we are working with a number of different partners to develop uh, such a holistic care platform. So, so um, first I would like to talk about the human-centered design approach. This uh, approach is particularly used in projects that require a high level of usability to be successful. And the human-centered um, design approach focuses on shifting away from a reactive um, approach to a proactive approach that aims to design and improve each element based on the target needs of specific category of users. And the aim is to gain uh, a deep understanding of uh, the groups of people who will use the product or service and interactively and based on the needs and requirements of the future users a product um, or service should be developed that creates um, real added value. And the process of a human-centered um, design encompasses the entire development life cycle of a product and service. The process can be divided into four um, phases. And the first step, uh, the context of use is analyzed. In this phase, uh, information about the potential users is collected and needs are identified. Um, also, the um, environment is analyzed. And uh, methodically, uh, competitors and target uh, groups could be analyzed. Um, 
personas um, developed and potential users interviewed in this phase, for example. And in the second phase, uh, requirements for the product or services uh, to be developed are defined. This is followed by the development of a uh, first craft um, or a concept. Um, um, this can uh, take um, the form of a design document, a mock-up, or a prototype, for example. Uh, then an evaluation of the developed concept and design takes place. Uh, this uh, involves checking the um, extent to which the identified requirements have been uh, implemented. And this usually involves taking, uh, talking to potential users again, trying out the mock-ups um, or the prototypes and interactively adapting the concept accordingly. And um, against the background of our research project, um, possible uh, competitors were identified and analyzed in the first step, as this was uh, our first step, and building on the competitor uh, analysis, qualitative expert interviews were conducted, and the aim of the analysis was to identify the needs, um, the wishes, and implementation ideas of potential users and providers of a peer platform. And the focus uh, was on the added value the platform would have to offer in uh, contest to existing solutions to be uh, used by people with assistance needs and their relatives and for uh, providers to offer the products and services um, on the platform. And uh, we interviewed a total of uh, 15 experts and the experts came from different fields, uh, for example, um, the nursing and social counseling, health and long-term care insurance, housing, uh, housing counseling, uh, financial service providers, and so on. Um, but um, due to the COVID-19 situation in 2020 and 2021, a qualitative survey of uh, persons with assistance needs and uh, their relatives were uh, not conducted, but instead a quantitative survey of persons predominantly over 50 years of age was conducted uh, in cooperation with the German Seniors League in uh, fall of 2021. Um, we um, interviewed uh, 466 people and on this basis, a uh, mock-up was developed, uh, which is currently uh, being evaluated. So um, in the following, Zara presents uh, some of the results of uh, these analyses. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, in our analysis, we uh, examined the needs of cities, of service providers, and of people with assistance needs. And um, cities, um, we did a literature research, and they are quite restricted in their scope of action by a tight budget and to ensure elderly health care supply or nursing supply, a platform is a cost efficient measurement that can be taken for cities, uh, as they are also obliged to care for their senior citizens as they uh, as the need of uh, to take social responsibility is stated within many legal uh, municipal regulations. And this can be achieved through a care plat platform that bundles in local service providers within cities. An expectation of cities of a care platform is for them to bring them added value, such as an increase in life quality. Um, for service providers, we, as Jelena stated, did expert interviews and a competitor analysis. And uh, the most important factor mentioned for service providers to use a CAD platform is the reduction and simplification of administrative workload and care documentation, because this takes up much time, which could be used to care for the patients. Uh, and furthermore, caregivers can flexibly work within the day and also choose their clients on the platform. And this enables um, mainly also new parents to, to slowly start working again um, and for service providers to coordinate employee losses efficiently and across suppliers. So um, yeah, many, um, many workers can work across um, suppliers. So this is better for them. Um, for people with assistant needs, uh, please continue, Yelena. Yes, um, for them, the simplification of the booking process is the main advantage um, if using a care platform instead of usual channel, uh, channels. And users may choose from a list of qualified service providers uh, and, an, and an artificial intelligence may even recommend services based on created user profiles, which makes the booking processes even more individual. And on the platform, um, you can create a profile uh, and on which you stage 
your name, your age, your location, your medication intake, and what kind of care services you need. And an artificial intelligence may then recommend you certain services based on this um, individual profile. And this um, also um, yeah, gives them transparency and guidance in the unclear care market, um, especially in Germany, there are many, many service providers and it is very yeah, difficult for users to choose a fitting one. And this could be yeah, simplified by a, a, through a care platform. Yeah, please continue. Thank you. Um, okay, now uh, we will move on to the business models. And even though business models are ubiquitous, there's no clear understanding of what a business model really is. But one thing is sure, the value proposition is in many uh, different business model types, a key concept. And the value proposition, uh, proposition reflects the benefits or the added value that customers achieve by buying a product or using a service. And in our human-centered design approach, we focus on different business model structures in accordance with the business model canvas by Osterwalder and Pigno. And in our analysis, we focus on the value proposition as key concept and also the channels and the customer aspects. And I'd like to start with um, yeah, the findings according to the value proposition as the most central aspects of a business model. And for service providers, it was very important that bureaucratic efforts such as billing efforts or formalities can be processed quickly and transparently through a platform. And cities may also save costs in using a digital, digital platform and have a service in their offerings that bundles all the other services um, of a city and gives an overview of what is locally possible on the care market. People with assisted needs uh, benefit from from a platform by having access to care information, among others. Okay, uh, let's continue with the channels uh, to address future users of digi digital services. And it was interesting to see that the internet is a very important source of information rather than friends and family, what we initially assumed. And also it is um, more important than other traditional channels such as care or nursing po support points which are something like consultation centers uh, to which you go to. Uh, but the internet becomes more and more important also for the very old uh, people. And uh, concerning customers, we found out uh, that especially uh, relatives um, are the main targets of existing care platforms. Um, and here a shift to people with assist needs is encouraged as they seem to be more internet savvy. Yeah, please continue, thanks. Um, Okay, uh, the human-centered design approach um, was conducted to successfully implement uh, the needs of several stakeholders within the smart city environment. And we saw that many different stakeholders, such as smart cities or people with assistant needs or service providers have different needs concerning a care platform. And therefore these needs have to be considered when developing such a service. Yeah, let me give you an overview overview of our upcoming work, which will um, continue to be human-centered. Um, focus groups and uh, participatory observations will be held starting May this year. <laughs> and uh, in these workshops, elderly people will evaluate a mock-up of the care platform, including smart speakers and chatbots currently developed by other members of our project's consortium group. We could describe this um, more detail later on if you'd like. And furthermore, um, expert interviews already take place. Uh, and in this, these expert interviews, we um, interview city officials, among others, um, uh, concerning data and information security, as we, um, yeah, we found out that this, this is really a challenging um, a challenge for um, cities and also projects within the smart city environment. And yeah, this is what we are currently doing and hope to do in the future. Thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask us. Thank you so much, Sarah and Elena, for your presentation. Any questions first from the participants, from the audience? I have a question, Sarah. What are your plans, future plans, beyond 
the survey that you have conducted beyond the code design that you have followed up? Um, in the projects or my personal? <laughs> no, no, in the project. Let's start okay. from, from the project. <laughs> Um, right, uh, we have the workshops and we do the expert interviews and um, we're currently also at the quite at the end of the project and we hope to give recommendation to our consortium members, which will yeah, start to maybe um, initiate the platform and we give recommendations so, um, concerning business models because we evaluate every um, aspect of business, business models currently. And we hope to yes, sustainably position a care platform on the market as it is um, yeah, quite hard in Germany at the moment. And many platforms we um, analyzed also failed. And with our analysis, which is quite yeah, human-centered, we hope that um, yeah, to successfully uh, position them on the market without them failing. Mm -hmm. Did or you would come you to like any? Sorry, did you come to any unexpected findings after performing um, these uh, yeah. user-centric analysis? Um, I think uh, in our quantitative research, as I said, um, we found out that many of the really very old people um, use the internet as a very informational um, yeah, resource. And we thought that this was not the case. Usually they, um, that they go to consultation centers because uh, in Germany uh, or in Dortmund, for example, there are very, very many of them, but um, yeah, they use the internet. And this was kind of like confirmation that this topic or this platform could be uh, yeah, relevant for them. I don't know, Jelena, if you'd like to add something. Um, in the uh, competitor analysis, we found out that um, there, um, that um, the person um, that needs assistance are not the um, target group or group of um, such platforms, uh, such care platforms. So um, they, um, the, the main target group were um, the, the relatives, but um, the child of um, people uh, with a need of assistance. And um, in the qualitative analysis, um, the, um, some of the experts say that um, the, um, the partner of the person that need care or, or assistance are the first person to go um, um, to, um, to help center to, to um, um, so, um, this is uh, an interesting part. So um, we um, see this person also as an um, interesting um, yeah, target group for the platform. Um, this is uh, one um, um, an interesting result. Um, so uh, the platform has another um, yeah, change. Also we have um, more uh, target groups and more customer groups. And um, yeah, this is uh, one part. Great. Great, Helena. Great, Sarah. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, Rob, please go ahead. Uh, I just have yeah, a very simple question, but this uh, problem you were studying is really familiar in Holland. Yeah, there's uh, many, many, many platforms, and we have many uh, experiments, uh, wrong implementation, whatever. Did you consider? To study the you know, say uh, initiatives here in Holland, for example, eh? what works, what didn't work, what were the main eh, uh, uh, learnings from it, eh? and uh, did you uh, this first question and the second question is uh, shouldn't you consider the institutional surroundings, so the way uh, care is organized, eh? so uh, there were. Uh, you can come up with a solution, but uh, if it doesn't, if uh, care isn't organized that way, uh, then uh, it is uh, it, 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 it is it is bound to fail, really, uh, because you will. Uh, that's really. I was just curious. So uh, that is why. Um, maybe to the first question, um, I actually considered it when doing research for my thesis or future thesis because um, yeah the uh, uh, Netherlands um, 
care system is quite a role model a bit <laughs> here in Germany. And so I think it's really interesting. Uh, we have also many uh, platforms here in Germany, but so many of them fail. So we would like to see, yeah, what could, could we do better now? What did they do maybe different or wrong? And maybe this is an interesting um, yeah, factor to also analyze yeah, international platforms as well. I will have a look into it, of course. Yeah, the many initiatives uh, in yeah. this respect, and also smart city concepts and care and on municipality uh, level, they are mm -hmm. yeah numerous. So it is quite uh, fun to study, of course. Yeah, maybe if you have uh, yeah recommendations on which to look into, you could uh, tell me in the uh, chat or, or... Uh, just send me <laughs> something like that. So I will give you some hints. So uh, this. <laughs> great thank you thank you everybody thank you for being here during this first session hello everybody good morning good afternoon good evening regarding the place that you are originally staying i would like to welcome you to the second session of the eighth version of our workshop entitled web and the city uh, this year we focused on uh, the particular perspective on, of environment in the urban space, trying to investigate the role of web in enhancing the environmental issues, the performance of the city in terms of health, in terms of uh, living, live, livability. So during the first session, we managed to we had the opportunity to hear from the contributors, from the presenters, different ideas that had to do with technological aspects that contribute to the city performance regarding the environment and, the, and regarding community centricity. And we also had the, the ability to exchange some ideas about how we can calibrate microservices in the urban space and uh, think of uh, more sophisticated services that uh, enhance the citizen the city performance so now we are here for the second session we are going to to hear from the presenters from three different groups of scholars similar aspects or let's see their ideas about uh, smart cities the role of the web and how we can contribute to the environmental aspects. The first presentation comes from Marco Cardia and Massimiliano Luca and Luca Papalardo. I think Marco Cardia is here. I don't know, Marco, if I pronounce it, pronounce your name correctly, you can, yes, of course. It's Cardia, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Welcome on board. You have the floor. Before, I would like to ask from each part, uh, participant and presenter, before starting his presentation, to make a brief introduction of, of himself and of his uh, work and team. So the floor is yours, Marco. So, Can you uh, share your should... screen? Yeah. Excellent. Is it screen? I think Rom Romain is uh, the assistant. The yes, yes, I am. Excellent. Nice to meet you, Romain. Nice to meet you too. I is think the, this session is being recorded, right? Yes, it is. Thank you, Romain. You see the presentation, or are you? Yeah. So, hello, everyone. I'm Marco Cardia, a PhD student at the University of Pisa. Today I will talk about how to enhance the cloud flow prediction mm -hmm. in different uh, spatial and temporal granularities. So uh, cloud flow prediction is about uh, human mobility and from a data science perspective it addresses different problems that are related to next location prediction and uh, trajectory generation in case of uh, individual mobility and instead in case of group uh, of people, it deals with uh, flow generation and uh, crowd flow prediction. In particular, we are addressing the crowd flow prediction problem. 
um, the solution of these problems as different uh, have different applications is indeed if we can uh, model in some way the human mobility we can also uh, prevent non desirable uh, events and also we can better address different problems it also uh, can also deal with uh, computational epidemiology uh, since if we can understand how to, how to spread an, an, an epidemic, we can also prevent some uh, problem that can happen. So as I said, we are talking about crowd flow prediction. And, but first of all, we have to understand what we mean by crowd flow. We refer to two main uh, concepts that are the incoming flow. That is the number of people that are entering in our region. In this case, we have uh, we can see that we have uh, an area that is divided into different squares, and in each square there is a number that represents the number of people that are coming inside a region from anywhere in the other squares. Instead, the outgoing flow represents the number that the, of people that are leaving a particular region, so a particular square, going uh, into in, uh, in another one. And uh, this definition allows us to define what we mean by crowd flow prediction problem. So we have a tessellation, as I said in the previous example, it was squared, but uh, we can also have administrative, uh, an administrative representation of our area of interest. We have the inflow and outflow, so the number of people that are uh, going inside the region or the number of people that are leaving. And also we have a time representation of this, uh, of the inflow and the, the outflow. So in some way we have the trend of the people that are leaving an area and then the trend of the people that are uh, coming inside a particular area. And what we want to do is to predict the inflow and the outflow of the, the next time interval. So given a historical representation, we want to uh, predict what uh, is the next inflow and outflow for each, uh, for each region. And this is an interesting problem, but also challenging because um, we have two dependencies to take into, into account that are the spatial and the temporal. So uh, in particular for the special, spatial dependencies, we have to understand that uh, the inflow and the outflow of a particular region depends not only by the closed regions, but also we have to consider the distant ones. And from a temporal perspective, we have to consider not only the previous time interval, so the previous what happens in the previous hours, but also what happened in the previous days, for example, or, or previous weeks. And for this reason, it, does not, it is not enough to use, for example, a statistical method to predict in some way this, uh, this trend. So um, for this reason, it is necessary to, to adopt some machine learning models. The very first uh, was STRESnet that was able to predict, predict the, the next inflow and outflow using a convolution networks, convolution neural networks. Mm -hmm. And also um, they, they capture the, the temporal dependencies using three submodules, each one capturing a different uh, uh, aspect. For example, the first one was capturing the previous hours. The second submodule was captured the uh, previous days and the last one captured the, the previous weeks. And they also use the taking into account the external features, for example, the weekends and the, and the weather conditions. And the problem of this mo the model and the other ones that take inspiration from these is that they used always the square tessellation. So they are um, um, adapted only to, to use the, the matrix representation of the reality. And so they are not able to use an uh, irregular tessellation. And they also mm, provide only the, mm, the, the inflow and the outflow. They have no idea from, of the origin and the destination of each flow. So our contribution is 
um, threefold. So we try to understand the origin and the destination of each flows. Our model is also able to deal with irregular tessellation, and we provide um, an evaluation using different tile size and uh, time interval. Uh, essentially, the input of, uh, of our model is a, is a graph, an origin destination matrix, in which so we have the for each tile, for each region, we have the, the origin and the destination of each flow for each tile. And our model is constructed in using two blocks, uh, two spatial temporal blocks. The time block uh, captures the time dependencies and, and it uses a convolutional neural network, while the spatial block captures the spatial dependencies and exploits a graph convolutional network. So the output of our network is again an adjacent matrix, so a weighted graph in some way that is able to uh, predict the flows, so the the origin and destination of each flow from each region. And uh, our experiments were run using three data sets, two are from two, the bike sharing system of New York and the Washington DC, and one more. Uh, is from the Taxi Beijing dataset. Each dataset has an origin and, and the destination and uh, the time of the travel, the date and the time of the travel. We split our dataset uh, using the training validation, and the validation set in particular was used to, to choose the best hyperparameters, and the test set is uh, used to, to compare our model to the other ones. Uh, we conduct two kinds of experiments. One was to compare um, our model to the other state-of-the-art models for the crowd flow prediction problem, so to predict in the flow and the outflow, while the other ones was um, conducted for to evaluate our model in the flow uh, prediction, so the origin destination matrix prediction. And in the second case, we can use the bot the square tessellation and also the administrative one. So concerning the inflow and outflow prediction, we use the, the square tessellation uh, using different sites for the tiles uh, and different time intervals. So we all, we, we predict the inflow and outflow for all the possible combination of the tessellation and time interval that you can see in the slide. And we evaluate, evaluate our model uh, using the three data set that uh, I just talked about. Concerning the evaluation matrix, we use the root, root mean square error as all the others um, state of the art models to have a comparison and the relative error to have a better understanding of the uh, overestimation or underestimation of the flows. Uh, for the results in the slide, you can see and the New York City data set heat map and the crowd net predictions. So the, the predictions of our model are very close to the real inflows and the prediction of uh, STRS net. In terms of RMSC, we have a better performance in uh, settings, for example. And so our network is able to capture the space dependencies special dependencies, while uh, concerning also the temporal dependencies, our network is able to, um, to get the correct trend. Uh, it uh, just a bit overestimates the, the flows, but our um, performance are very close to the ones of the steerers net. Um, more in general, if we uh, watch from a time inter, the different time intervals and the different time sites, we have a performance very close to STRS net. Our model outperforms in particular when we have big uh, crowd flows. So in the case of 60 minutes of time interval and almost all the time sites. Concerning the 
prediction of the origin destination matrix so the flow prediction we can use also the administrative tessellation so an irregular tessellation and again we perform the same experiments of before and but in this case we evaluate the model performance using the common part of commuters that is a way of um, evaluate the flow prediction and the common part of commuters is uh, as the source and dice definition is defined as the number of times that our model predict correctly a flow uh, over the number of uh, the total um, number of flows in a region and uh, this number goes from zero to one where one is uh, perfect where the flow is uh, always corrected and while zero is always uh, and so we can uh, have the the results in the regular tessellation again also in this case our model is very close to the to the real representation but also we conduct uh, different uh, experiments in this case for example we are able to provide the destination for each uh, for each flow for example in this case we are representing the uh, the outflow from the, the cell number 19 and we can see where is the destination of each of each uh, movement of the bike in this case so we can uh, provide more insights for policy makers and stakeholders because we provide not only the number of people that are living in an area but also the destination and uh, and also the the source the, the origin uh, concerning the cpc we have values that goes um, better in case of bigger flows so in uh, example in the time interval of 60 minutes we reach a cpc of 0 0.4 but in case of the tile sites of uh, 1001 kilometer and one half we get also 0 0.6 um, we studied more deeply our model and we see we compare them in a normalized way the performance of each tile sites and time interval and we can see that uh, again also in this case we obtain better results in uh, when we have uh, bigger flows so as the flows increases our performance became better in terms of time interval on the other hand if we increase the tile sites our models get uh, get worse um, we also uh, we want to understand how many time intervals are necessary to, to improve our predictions. And as we can see, as the number of the previous time interval that we think, take into account the, the RMC uh, decreases, so our performance are better. But at a certain point, we do not get any improvement so we find that the best number of previous time intervals gets a plateau in, uh, in around 11 uh, when we consider 11 time intervals so um, we have uh, the state of the art results in crowd flow prediction for in our model but we provide better information for policymakers since we provide also we are reached the prediction with the this the origin and the destination of each flow we can use the irregular tessellation for so for example the administrative areas and uh, uh, in our settings we provide also the code and the free data set so uh, you are able to rerun our our tests what we would like to do is to provide better explainability so since our model right now is working as black box we would like to understand better how this prediction are made and we would like also to add a fusion mechanism to our model in order to provide a different weight for each for each input that uh, it is provided uh, thank you for the attention if you have any question thank you so much marco for your presentation any questions, remarks, comments from the audience? 
Rob? I have a little question, Marco. Absolutely. Uh, and did you consider uh, this uh, about the predictions? Uh, to to uh, you have uh, you have time intervals. Uh, you have made predictions per day, per period, uh, and then. But did you uh, consider to uh, to slice the in and outflows from its location, uh, uh, the characteristics of the location? Uh, the, in, put in other words. Uh, uh, people uh, travel with uh, always with a habit. They go from 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 house to school. Uh, they uh, they have all these habits. So you have all the data. Uh, you have all the uh, uh, GPS, whatever. Then you can also uh, uh, model. Uh, there are uh, some uh, repetitive patterns in your data. So if you slice them like that, then then uh, there, uh, maybe there is some more. Uh, that you can more uh, better explain the variance in your in your prediction itself. So, uh, did you consider that this type of analysis? Yeah, so thank you. Uh, so, do you mean to consider the trend, some way of the what's happening in the previous um, time? Uh, the people go from 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 home to work, yeah. in and out. Uh, so you yeah. have all these locations, and all these locations have special purposes. Mm -hmm. So okay. people go to a shopping mall, uh, have uh, social. Uh, so on the Monday we see other patterns uh, than on the Saturday. So mm -hmm. because their uh, their intention uh, to travel from A to B is another one. So yeah. and now everything is in one measure. Uh, so uh, you you need lots mm -hmm. of lots of data, but by uh, but by uh, by uh, slicing in that way, you need yeah. far less data. So your predictions will be better. So yeah, this is in some way collected by using the different uh, periods. So if we consider uh, the time week, so what the network watch is uh, on Monday, what I did on Monday uh, at the same time. So it studies in some way the trend of the Monday, of the Mondays, so of the Tuesdays, and so on. Yeah. So this is the way how the network works. Yeah, I don't know if I answer your question. No, 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 no. I was just curious. I do okay. lots of, uh, I do lots of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, tax, taxi plane services. So we have to predict the capacity needed for one. Uh, in a time period in a day, so in the morning, in the afternoon, and yeah. so these these type of scheduling and routing problems. So that's why I was interested. Okay. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Rob. Any other questions from the participants? Marco, I have a question. This is actually a typical machine learning process. Is this correct? To make predictions, did you try to investigate the origins the, uh, the 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 sources the reasons of this uh, mobility in order to optimize the the predictions or you just try to utilize the data sources that you had and your availability so what we watch was for example we try to understand what happens in particular days I have a slide that I can show. For example, we try to understand what happened in uh, a particular day. If our model was able to understand it, for example, we consider a rainy day. And as you can see, we it, it get the trend in some way that I don't know for this, for this reason. I would like also to apply some uh, explainability model to understand why it gets really the trend of a rainy day. Why isn't it just the, gave us sunny day, for example, in that occasion. And we watch also for particular days, for example, in the weekends and so on. So we try to understand in this particular case what okay. happened. Okay, these are some, let's say, uh, variables that uh, affect the, um, the data set performance or the data generation. Uh, Anyway, it looks indeed some kind of uh, test and error or something like that. You didn't locate any other reasons for uh, for this mobility yeah. performance. You didn't try others, right? Let's say working days, hours. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Also working days, but uh, yeah, we consider also working days exactly, uh, or holidays and so on. Uh -huh. um, yeah, there is a worse performance, but in general, did, did, did you recognize any, let's say, correlations between the spaces that some people prefer moving from, let's say, uh, rectangle number one to rectangle number twelve, mm -hmm. and this is not an accident, something like that. Yes, this is a very interesting point, and we would like to deep in these, uh, also uh -huh. in these uh, uh -huh. uh, cases. Because this is better. yeah, this is really interesting, especially for big cities, which do not hold the only uh, downtown where people go to work and do their shopping, etc. Thank you so much, Marco. Thank you very much. Thank you. It would be great to receive your future updates of your study. Thanks. So let's step forward with the next presentation, which comes from uh, the group from Cyprus. I think, Lucas, you are here on their behalf, right? Yes, right. Thank you. Excellent. Lucas, you have the floor. Thank you. I will share my screen just a minute. I think it's okay. You can see the, uh, the presentation in full screen, right? Yes, indeed. So, so hello, my name is Lugas Hajuvasili, and I currently work as a special scientist at the University of Cyprus. I will make this presentation regarding our proposed paper I would title a framework to enhance smart citizen science in coastal areas. So this paper is a joint work between the University of Cyprus and Fourth Research Center of Greece. And the research for this paper was undertaken during the Socio Coast project of the cooperation program Interreg Greek Cyprus 2014-2020 which is co-founded by the, by the European Union and the National Funds of Greece and Cyprus. Well, I will start with some introductory points uh, regarding the concept of smart cities and how it is connected to our work. Uh, smart cities can fully utilize uh, citizen science data to improve uh, the efficiency of city services such as smart tourism and smart transportation. Uh, sorry, I see. No, it's. Uh, I move to the to the next slide. I'm sorry. Uh, life quality in a city can be affected by the way citizens interact uh, with the city. Uh, under a smart uh, city concept, citizens are acting like human sensors. Uh, reporting natural hazards, uh, generating uh, real-time data, and uh, enhancing awareness about environmental issues. And our work emphasizes to coastal areas and beaches to be considered as smart ones. Uh, smart design cities can fully utilize citizen science data to improve the efficiency of city services, such as smart tourism and smart transportation and environmental assistance and awareness, which was mentioned in the previous slide, could be enhanced through identifying and mapping uh, citizens' knowledge uh, in these cities. Uh, towards this end, we introduced a framework presented uh, in this slide, aimed at utilizing biodiversity data from open source platforms and organizational observations collecting the knowledge generated from citizens and enhancing citizens' awareness and reporting environmental issues in the selected uh, coastal areas. The figure presented in this slide demonstrates uh, this framework. At the left side, we can observe the different data sources that are used consisted of both historical and real-time data. 
data loaders collect all the data from multiple sources and store it in a database. Also, an internal API will be built uh, to service uh, data requests in our framework. In the center of the figure, it is the data handling uh, component, as we called it, that will be analyzed in one of the next slides. Uh, the last components on the right side are the dashboard, which is a part of the web platform uh, of our framework. Uh, the mobile application, which complements um, the web platform of the framework, and then data sharing that will enable users to export subsets of the available data through the web platform's internal API. Next, I will analyze uh, some of these uh, components uh, a bit more. Uh, the data sources of the proposed framework are divided into institutional observations, open source applications and platforms for oceanography and also biodiversity data, as well as user generated content, which is called also UGC iNaturalist uh, is one of the most well-known citizen science open data platform. It is in fact a, a species recognition system and this data set could be used as an important data source uh, for biodiversity uh, data of this framework. Similarly, Poseidon and Copernicus systems are important data sources for oceanography and weather forecasting data. Uh, for the selected uh, coastal areas. Uh, User-generated uh, user content uh, constitutes a valuable contribution for enriching a city's, a city's uh, crowdsourcing knowledge. By combining the above data sources, the proposed framework can contribute to shaping small, sorry, smart coastal areas and beaches. Another important component is the data handling uh, component. Large volume and historical data are stored locally in files of different uh, format, such as CSV files or NetCDF. In order to reduce the response time of the API calls used to collect this data. For the real time data, we intend to set a narrow time window uh, for API calls to frequently update uh, this data during the day. Big data analysis will operate as a large scale data analytics engine uh, by handling two subcases. The one is to check the volume uh, of a data set and depending on this volume, the data will be handled using batch files. The other part uh, will be the use of data analysis algorithms to extract beneficial result and conclusions about this data. Data Lake is a way of managing data containing all forms of data that are stored on the knowledge platform in one way or another. Uh, it constitutes a good technique that will help in the sustainability uh, of the framework. To continue, a dedicated dashboard will be included in the web platform of the proposed framework. All users will be able to browse the platform and view information and data about the various features that will be included. However, some selected data or information will be visible to users, uh, only to users with a valid account uh, on the platform and um, also a uh, crowdsourcing and problem report uh, as well. Uh, for valid users, the, function, the functionality uh, on the dashboard will also depend on the user type. As we understand, there will be different uh, types of users in this framework. And a few words about uh, the mobile application. A special emphasis will be given to a user-friendly interface in order to make its use uh, more attractive to users. The user will be authenticated in the knowledge platform through uh, the mobile application. Uh, the application will contain rich and accurate uh, information that will help the users to utilize the comforts 
and characteristics uh, of each beach. Uh, the application will also allow the user to report issues regarding the condition of the infrastructure of a blue flag coastal area or any other problem uh, in this uh, coastal area uh, or beach. Uh, users will also be able to contribute uh, new data uh, that they identify through uh, their personal observation uh, to the web platform. Both reporting and contribution with uh, new data will rely on receiving just special information from the user's uh, mobile in order to identify the exact location uh, of uh, the observation. And as we said, uh, the proposed framework uh, will be used uh, by various uh, categories of users, or as we call them, stakeholders. One of them is visitors. Uh, visitors of beaches and uh, coastal areas can be further divided uh, in ordinary citizens and uh, explorers. Citizens uh, usually visit uh, this area for entertainment purposes, whereas explorers uh, visit uh, these areas uh, for research uh, purposes. Uh, mainly uh, having the chance to contribute uh, to crowdsourcing uh, through the mobile application. Both citizens and explorers, as uh, also it is mentioned before, could report uh, possible problems uh, that they observe uh, during their visits. Uh, another uh, category uh, is relevant organizations or authorities. Uh, this group consists of organizations and local authorities uh, that are related to the preservation of beaches and uh, coastal areas, such as uh, non-profit organizations and municipalities of uh, these coastal areas. They will be responsible for solving uh, reported problems from uh, reported from the users that are under their just jurisdiction and also to raise environmental awareness uh, of local citizens. Uh, business uh, men or business uh, women can also be a type of user uh, to our framework. These uh, people are citizens who own uh, business, uh, business uh, near um, the targeted beaches like cafes, restaurants, uh, beach bars or hotels. Uh, they can promote the proposed framework uh, to the local community by providing their resources and contacts. And uh, administrators uh, are authorized users who are responsible for the overall uh, supervision of our system and its smooth operation. They will be able also to accept uh, or reject requests uh, for new users to register, change their passwords, um, or answer to uh, possible questions they have. To conclude, our future plan for this project includes around uh, four directions. The first one is the implementation of uh, this proposed framework using real data sets and data analysis algorithms as well. Secondly, we plan to enrich the open data set to find naturalist using the user generated content for, collected from the mobile application uh, component as explained. Another thing is to develop a smart online virtual lab, which will enhance the data scientist in biodiversity uh, data analytics area to create their own uh, reports or projects. And uh, lastly, we plan to configure the system to correspond not only to a few targeted coastal areas, but uh, to be operable in other areas and beaches as well, uh, as well all over Europe or perhaps all over the world. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Also, thanks to the chairman of the workshop uh, for approving our work. And let me know if you have any questions uh, for the framework. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Lucas. Actually, you know, this, this was a blind review process that approved your work and not the chairman, but thank you for your good works, good words. I see also that Maria Papuzoglu is here, who I had the chance yes, Maria to Luis discuss. Also, so. Nice yes. to meet you, Maria. Mm -hmm. Nice and to meet you too. I don't know if uh, the participants have any questions, remarks, suggestions for you. Well, I could make, let's say, a comment just to explore your future steps. I remember uh, one of the, let's say, types of games that are being followed in uh, countries or at least in regions with uh, coastal areas that they follow was to engage visitors and tourists in uh, keeping the coastal areas clean by motivating them be engaged in several events and collect garbage from the coastal and to return them, let's say, free stains or tax returns, tax refunding as a, as a benefit. I don't know if you have thought, since this is a work in progress, this was a, a short article that has been uh, accepted for publication in our workshop. I don't know if you have thought of these topics of data games or information games that could follow your framework and your application or yes, other types, other ideas that you have considered. Thank you, Lucas. Yes, thank you. Uh, it is a very good idea. idea we uh, consider it and um, we thought of it um, before as well. And um, in the uh, processing, um, in the paper, um, the main goal was to present uh, uh, the framework um, we designed, uh, let's say, but uh, of course, uh, as we proceed to the implementation, uh, we can uh, think about um, uh, many ideas uh, as well to, uh, to implement, of course, uh, the um, environmental issues and uh, the uh, preservation of uh, our uh, beaches um, in Greece and Cyprus and also um, uh, in all over the Europe uh, in the future. It is uh, very important uh, uh, for us in this, uh, in this project and of course it is uh, the, main, uh, the main goal, uh, let's say, of the project because uh, through these ideas uh, we can also attract uh, more uh, people uh, in our beaches, uh, we, we believe. Uh, so, yes, thank you for your recommendation also. Uh, generally, also, uh, we have in mind the gamification option, if it is uh, related uh, to this idea, Mr. Anthopoulos. Uh, I'm yes. not sure. Generally, we have uh, in mind uh, because uh, um, our uh, applications are uh, user-centric, uh, let's say, uh, we will try to include a kind of a gamification approach uh, like uh, badges, if you know the structure of, uh, for example, some kind of Q&A communities which are very well known, uh, like uh, Stack Overflow let's uh, say, uh, where users are um, receive some kind of uh, award for their participation. So in the process of uh, their, their reporting actions like the garbage collectors, uh, we, could, uh, we have in mind to set a, a kind of a gamification approach in the community. Excellent then. And I don't know if uh, your framework would also be applicable to areas without coasts. I mean, with useful uh, sightseeing, but uh, how different would be if this would not be co a coast area? Yes it's, a, <laughs> yes, it's a good uh, option. Actually, our features are, um, let's say, unfortunately, a little, uh, are related only to coastal areas. Uh, because we use uh, data sources like uh, the, actually, 
the kind uh, of uh, specific features we try to uh, include in our framework in order to a smart city concept, let's say, uh, are uh, data sets from uh, the beaches uh, because we have uh, some kind of uh, institutional data which are observations, uh, exactly lo uh, they are local observations uh, from uh, the target areas. So unfortunately, only maybe some generic features could uh, be adapted in other uh, smart uh, city types. I'm not sure, but uh, maybe only the crowd uh, source option for uh, environmental issues, because I think uh, in smart cities there are also other environmental issues uh, which could uh, adapt it under a, a more environmental framework, let's say. Maybe if there are local uh, lakes, for example, and uh, they uh, attract uh, the crowd uh, in this area also, maybe this could be an extension. Okay, thank you, Maria. I, before closing, I don't know if we have other remarks. I would share with you a link to an ITU working item, which okay. deals with uh, smart seas and smart oceans. And perhaps you could think of, let's say, connecting your data sources with Internet of Things that deal with, let's say, safe seas and uh, the quality of waters and other things, mm -hmm. just, just for your information. Okay, yes, thank perfect. You. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Maria. So if we don't have other comments or questions, all right, mm -hmm. we can we can proceed with our last presentation for today. Our last presenter would be Professor Sen. Aaron, I hope it will not be that hard for you. I don't know what time is in Arizona now. Well, actually, I was going to comment on that. So I was going to start by saying good morning to good morning, good evening. Good, very early morning to participants from Europe, Asia, and the Americas. My name is Arun Sen. I'm a professor of computer science and engineering at Arizona State University. I'm currently spending my sabbatical at uh, National University of Singapore. So for me, it's early evening. And I'm making the presentation because my student, uh, he refused to do it because it's 2.30 in the morning for him. And this, uh, so he refused to get up. It makes sense, actually. <laughs> okay. All right, so that's my introduction. And the other thing I was going to say that what I'm going to talk about has been touched upon by many earlier presenters, uh, starting with the first presenter about the sensors. Uh, my talk will be about sensors. And uh, you mentioned that the theme of this workshop is about the uh, quality of life in smart cities and sensors, quality of smart city. I think one of the presenters mentioned about uh, threat through critical infrastructures. And uh, the last presenter was mentioning about sensors. In my talk, I'm going to talk about sensors. But when I mean sensors, I don't necessarily mean some electronic device or anything of that sort. It could be a variety of things. And in fact, in the last presenter mentioned about human sensors. The basic idea that we are going to use, actually we have used in many, many different domains, many different types of networks. For example, uh, we use these ideas in a criminal network monitoring where a policeman could serve as a sensor. Okay, so these ideas for this particular talk, I'm going to talk only about water uh, distribution and network, how to monitor water distribution network and on so on. All right, so I can share my screen now. Okay, all right, thanks. Yes, you can, Aaron. Okay, so as I said that sensor network designed for uniquely identify sources of con contamination in water distribution network. Okay, so now water distribution network is one of the most critical infrastructure in any modern city. And it's definitely going to affect the quality of life if the water quality, uh, water quality is compromised or contaminated and things like that. 
And these are basically large networks of storage tanks, walls, pumps, pipes that transport clean water to customers over vast areas through hundreds and thousands of miles of pipe. Water distribution systems are most vulnerable component of drinking water systems, either from accidental or malicious contamination. Actually, United States government was very conscious, uh, aware of these issues in the early 2000s. Uh, there was threat to water distribution systems from various sources and so on and so forth. So quite a bit of studies has been done as to, as to monitor these water distribution systems and all that. And uh, this is basically the motivation that is why we need to monitor water distribution systems. Water distribution systems essentially look something like this. We have the storage reservoirs, we have the pumping stations, we have the pipes uh, spreading hundreds and uh, thousands of miles. Now, when we try to do some sort of analysis, of course, we have to build a model of this uh, water distribution system. The water distribution system what we do is basically most often a graph is used to model the water distribution system. So we have a set of nodes, we have a set of edges. The nodes essentially represent some sources, maybe demand points, points or two or more pipes meet. So basically some sort of junction point, then the pumping stations, water treatment plants, valves, fire hydrants. These are essentially represented as vertices. These are represented as vertices Edges represent the pipes that distributed water to various parts of the city. And this water distribution system graph may comprise of hundreds of thousands of nodes and edges, hundreds and thousands of nodes. And, and in the end, I'll show you some experiments starting with some small, small networks to some large networks involving thousands of nodes and edges and so on. So it actually looks something like this. Uh, these are, I have just picked up a couple of different networks uh, involving, uh, these are not thousands of uh, nodes. So this is a fairly small size network. So just to give an idea how these networks look like. Okay, so monitoring water distribution sensor. So now, as I mentioned that talking about sensors, so people talk about uh, sensors. Uh, sensors could be many, many different types in a city. For example, uh, monitoring traffic flow. Monitoring traffic flow, you need some type of sensors. Monitoring water contamination, you need a different type of sensors. Uh, for that could be variety of sensors. Variety of sensors in a smart city, there probably will be thousands and thousands of sensors, thousands of many different types of sensors. But the one thing is that these sensors cost money. These sensors cost money. Uh, and uh, if you can use less sensors, then your design, of course, will be more attractive. Design will be more attractive. You can do the same thing with uh, 10 sensors. If you deploy 20 sensors, of course, uh, that will not be the most attractive thing. Essentially, you are wasting uh, 10 sensors. Now, however, sensor part is it can sense water quality. Okay, for the purpose of this study, we assume that the sensors are placed at the nodes. Okay, the sensors could have been placed at the edges also, but one uh, advantage of placing them in the nodes is that it can monitor all the links that are going out of that node. Okay, and this assumption is used in many of the other studies as well. So we basically pretty much follow the same thing. So the goal of the sensor placement problem in our, this particular case is contamination or detection of water distribution system. Is an, so this can be viewed as a general uh, broad area, what is known as facility location problem. This is known as facility location problem and operation research people have been studying this facility location problem for many, many years. And there probably are hundreds of papers on various different types of facility locations problems have been studied. Now, approaches taken by the researchers in just in this water distribution network, including solving P median type of problems or set cover type of problems and some other cases, uh, other researchers have taken some multi-objective optimization approaches and so on. Now, many of these studies, essentially the design goal as most, most studies is not to identify the source node of contamination. So if it passes through pile, one would like to know where, where it is coming from, where it is coming from, their goal is essentially to try to identify, well, the water has been contaminated. Now, what we are trying to do differently is basically our objective is not only to try to study contamination, identify contamination, essentially try to identify the source of contamination, source node of the contamination, 
from the signals picked up by these uh, sensors. Okay, so underlying mathematical uh, principles that we use is what is known as identifying codes, which is not very well known. Okay, it's not very well known. So I'm just uh, stating of what exactly is meant by identifying codes. Identifying codes, uh, although it's called code, this has more to do with graphs than to do with codes. It's uh, basically a subset of vertices uh, V prime of V. This is called the identifying code set. If intersection set of this V prime with this N plus V, N plus V is essentially what we call the close neighborhood set of the node V. So NV is the close neighbor, it's basically the nodes that are adjacent to node V. Nodes that are adjacent to node V together with the node V itself, that's what we call the closed neighborhood set of node V. And what we want is that the closed neighborhood set of node V intersection of V prime, this should be unique. And what we would want to do is that we want to identify the set or smallest such set of this V prime, smallest cardinality V prime, which has this property, which has this property. Now, not all graph, <coughs> not all graph is going to have this identifying code set. Necessary and sufficient condition for a graph to have identifying code set is essentially that two nodes should not have the same closed neighborhood set. If two nodes have the closed neighborhood set, these things cannot be unique. Intersection set cannot be unique. This uh, N plus VI and N plus VJ, they are identical. Intersection set is not going to be unique. And these uh, nodes, if they have the same closed neighborhood sets, these are called twins. These are called twins. So, and this is both necessary and sufficient, which implying that if a graph has twins, identifying code set cannot be found. And if the graph does not have twins, it can be found. It can be found. Let me give an example of what I mean by all of these things. I think the example would be a lot easier to follow. So here what I have is basically a graph with 10 nodes. And here the assumption is, there is an underlying assumption for this scheme to work that a sensor, for example, if a sensor is placed at node V1, not only it can detect sense what is going on in this node, it can also detect what is going on in the neighboring nodes. For example, if, if I place a sensor at V1, it can, uh, if there is contamination uh, detected in, uh, not only in V1, V5, V6, and V7, it will still be able to detect it. It will still be able to, let me give an example. Let's say consider a hotel uh, complex. Now in each hotel complex, you probably have a smoke detector in every single room. Okay, smoke detector in every single room. If there is a fire in one room, that smoke detector is supposed to go up and somebody sitting on the front of the control panel can identify that this room is on fire. Okay, something needs to be done about that. Now, if you think of a situation that there are two adjacent rooms and there is a door between them, then that the open space between two different rooms. So it is reasonable to assume that if there's a fire in one room, the smoke most likely is going to go to the adjacent room. Smoke most likely is uh, go to the adjacent room, which essentially means I may not have to deploy smoke detectors in both the rooms. One room may be sufficient in order to be able to detect fired in any one of these two rooms. That's basically the idea. Okay, that's basically the idea how far, in some sense, MOOC, you can think of the signal. Signal can propagate from one room to another room. So if the signal can go from one room to another room, then people don't need to deploy sensors in every single room. So that's in terms of graph, that's basically not V1 node. If a sensor is placed at V1, not only it can detect uh, if fire is in this room, but if there's a fire in uh, V5 and V6 or V7, it will still be able to detect it. Okay, so now I gave this uh, definition about this uh, intersection set of V prime with, uh, so in this example, let's say if I put sensors in V1, V2, V3, and V4, if I look at the closed neighborhood set of V1, that will be V1, V7, V6, and V5. Intersection set with that, with V1, V2, V3, four is basically just V1, okay, just V1. Similarly, if you just, uh, let me just uh, do it for one more. So let's say V5, if I consider the close neighborhood of V5, uh, close neighborhood of V5 will be V5, V2, and V1. And intersection set of that with V1, V2, V3, V4 will be V1, V2. It will be V1, V2. 
So what this table is basically giving is in some sense, you can think of these are signatures of these rooms. And someone who is sitting in front of the control panel with only lamps corresponding to these four sensors, these four sensors are normally, they are green. And if a signal is detected, let's say it turns red. Let's say it turns red. So if there's a fire in room uh, V1, only the lamp corresponding to V1 is going to turn red. Okay, if there is a <clears throat> fire in room V5, V1 and V2 lamps are going to turn red. When the V1, V2 turn, lamps turn red, the person who is monitoring this is going to know for sure the fire is in room number V5. Okay, so in this case, basically you can, as I said, that these could be sent, uh, signatures and these are unique signatures. These are unique signatures. So for example, if I take V10, V3, V4, if the lamps corresponding to V3, V4 uh, turns red, then the person monitoring the system will know that the room is in, uh, the room in fire is on V10. So what this identifying code is essentially doing is basically giving a unique signature to all these rooms. So now in this kind of a situation, instead of having 10 sensors, I can deploy only four sensors and yet have the capability of uniquely identifying a room when it's on fire. Okay, so that's the idea of the identifying code. And in fact, it can be shown that if you have an node graph, you might require as few as log n number of sensors to be able to have unique identification capability for all these n number of rooms. Now that's not going to happen for every graph, but there are certain type of graphs where it could be as small as log of n. Okay. Now, these type of things has been studied for a while. Now, the one that we are going to, we are basically studying and uh, as far as I can tell that not a whole lot of studies has been done in this area. So in this example, you need to have four sensors to have unique identification capability for every single node. Four is the least number that is necessary. Four is the least number that is necessary. We consider a scenario what we call budget constraint environment. Budget constraint environment, what we mean by budget constraint environment, let's say you have some constraint as far as the budget, which basically does not allow you to buy more than three sensors the first year. Okay, it doesn't uh, first year. So now you are operating only with three sensors and you know for sure you are not going to have unique signature capability for every single room, because in order to do that, you are going to require at least four sensors. You're going to require at least four sensors with three, you cannot do it, it's impossible to do it. So now in this kind of situation, solution that uh, finds the least number of sensors in a budget constraint environment, whenever possible deploy the least number of sensors. Okay, so let's say P is the least number of sensors that will be needed for unique identification and Q is the maximum sensors that can be deployed under budget constraint. P happens to be Q, greater than Q, then uh, we basically have an impossible task. We have an impossible task. So the goal in this scenario, maybe to deploy Q sensors in such a way that will maximize the number of nodes that will have a unique signature. So we may not be able to uniquely monitor 10 of these nodes. Maybe with three, we'll be able to do monitor eight of them. That's the goal. Okay, so if you put a restriction on the number of sensors that can be deployed, we'd like to have this unique identification capability with the largest possible number of rooms. Largest possible number, of, we know that it's not going to be all the rooms, but we want to maximize the number of rooms that can be uniquely identified, which can basically going to have a unique signature. So that's basically the problem. And uh, there are uh, basically, we can get into this can have many different types of formulation. One is the, set cover type of formulation. There is something, uh, the optimization version of set cover is what's known as maximum set cover problem. While we are doing this, we basically came across one version of the problem which can be viewed as a generalization of the set cover problem, what we call maximum set group cover problem. Now, the reason why you consider that, let me just go into why we did that. Okay, why we did that, see that in order to be able to distinguish between the nodes VI and VJ, so VI is going to have uh, a close neighborhood set, V2 or VJ is going to have a close neighborhood set. In order to distinguish between these two, I need to place one 
node, okay, one node in one of these. So this is the exclusive OR here, close neighbor of V1, close neighbor of VJ. In order to be able to distinguish between the nodes VI and VJ, I must deploy a sensor in this set. If I do not have a sensor, that will not be able to distinguish between VI and VJ. VI and VJ will end up having the same signature. VI and VJ is going to, so if we put something in the exclusive OR, it will be able to distinguish between VI and VJ. So that is what we call the distinguishing set. This we call the distinguishing set. Now, this set, if I pick up an element from this set, it will be able to distinguish between VI and VJ. Similarly, I'm going to have something for VI and VK. If I want to distinguish VI not only from VJ, I want to distinguish VK and VL and every other one, I need to pick up one from uh, distinguishing set VI, VJ, one from distinguishing set from VI, VK, one from distinguishing VI, VL, and so on and so forth. If I pick up one node from all of these things, that set, if I pick up all the nodes from that set, that is going to uniquely identify node V1. This is what we call isolation set. In order to isolate or in order to, for VI to have a unique signature, I need to pick up at least one node from all of these uh, sets for different values of VJ. Okay, this is what we call the isolation set. We talked about distinguishing set, isolation set, and also we can say which are the nodes where a certain node VI is present. Uh, we have this uh, close neighborhood set, we have distinguishing set. Just to give an example here in this example, I just computed all the distinguishing sets. For example, distinguishing set between one and four. So if I pick up any place sensors in any one of these nodes, it will be able to distinguish between one and four. If I pick up a uh, node from this set, it will be able to distinguish between one and eight. Okay, so if I pick up one from this set, one from this set, then it will be able to distinguish one from four and also from eight. It also from eight will be able to do that. And uh, this, we also just, I described this isolation set. So if I pick up something from this set, from this set, all these things are covered, then node one can be isolated. So basically node one is going to have a unique signature through which we can identify that. So this type of problem formulation give rise to this uh, new version of this on some sort of generalization of the set cover problem, which has been widely studied is this is what we call set group cover, where these two sets, one of them correspond to distinguished sets, another set correspond to the isolation sets and so on. And it requires some special, in a, so basically this maximum set group cover is a generalization of set cover. And uh, it's basically a special case when the second group size happens to be equal to one, coordinate of the second group size happens to be equal to one, the group set cover essentially becomes the same as the set cover problem. Now, one very interesting thing is that all of these problems are computationally hard. That is all in uh, computer science, we say it's NP-complete problems. NP-complete problems, all of these are NP-complete problems. The interesting thing is about this maximum set cover problem, there exists a very good approximation algorithm, which a performance guarantee. It says that no matter what, it will it will provide a solution which is at least 60% or better than the optimal solution. 60% or better than the optimal solution. Now, what we found very interesting that this generalization, essentially that property just goes away. So we can no longer say that what is true for maximum set cover is going to be true for maximum set group cover. So this constant factor approximation that can be found for maximum set cover cannot be found. Basically, we are basically saying, non-existence of uh, this, uh, such an algorithm. Unless P equal to NP, there cannot be a polynomial and approximation algorithm for this uh, group set group cover problem with a performance factor guarantees that the approximate solution will be one minus one times the optimal solution or uh, the approximate optimal solution. Now, when the set size becomes equal to one, actually something like this can be found. Something like this can be found where the X is equal to the base of the natural logarithm based on the, which is, uh, we thought it was pretty interesting. So what we did, we eventually did some experiments with some data experimentation. And uh, what we did, we basically took the data from this uh, Kentucky Water Resources Research Institute. They have a large volume of these data sets and it has these uh, junctions, uh, tanks, reservoirs, and all of that. 
and we varied our budget 25% of the minimum number that is needed before monitoring all the nodes, 50%, 75%, and so on and so forth. And we basically saw these kinds of results. So you can see that the number of nodes were as few as 12 here, all the way up to close to 2,500 here. 2,500 here, the number of edges were almost 5,000 for uh, this network, almost 5,000 for this network. And these were the optimal uh, solution. So in order to monitor this, 161 uh, uh, nodes need to have uh, sensors. Uh, this one needed to have. Now, when we had this budget, 25% of the capacity or 25% of these values or 50% of these values or 75% of the, these values, the number of nodes for which we could get the unique signatures, these are the numbers that are given here. These are the numbers that are given here. Now, what is interesting is that when we have the budget 25% of the minimum budget needed for monitoring all the nodes, the number of nodes for which we could find unique signature is actually greater than 25%. Almost all of them is greater than 25% here. All of them are greater than 50% here in the, this column, and all of them are greater than 75% uh, in this column. Not by large margin, by somewhat smaller, uh, somewhat uh, greater than, we never had a situation that uh, we are, uh, the, when the, this is 50%, uh, we are able to cover less than 50%. Now that may very well be dependent on the structure of the graph. In fact, it has uh, basically, it could be that we are seeing this property only because these water distribution networks have only a certain type of structure. If you didn't have this structure, if you had a different structure, maybe these things would not have been uh, true. Okay, so we did, and then we did basically computation time and all that. So with that, pretty much, uh, let me wrap up my presentation. That is, we basically said that this, uh, the benefits outweigh the cost. And we basically said that uh, for one version of the problem, there cannot be an approximation algorithm with a constant factor performance guarantee unless P equal to NP. And uh, we are basically working on uh, various different ways, uh, including scalable solution going beyond uh, 2000 nodes going to maybe three, four, 5,000, 10,000 node graphs and so on and so forth and trying to see how much computation time it takes. And also we are examining different objectives for the problem. Now, what I mean by different objectives, the one that I just described, the goal with the limited budget was to have unique signature for as many nodes as possible. Now, what happens to the rest of it? We are not saying anything. Okay, we are not saying anything. Now, it could very well be that not having rest, not being able to say anything, it could very well be that if there is a fire in a room, the person in the monitoring center may not even be able to know that there is a fire in this room. That definitely is not a desirable thing. That may not definitely be a desirable thing. It could also be that five different rooms may end up having exactly the same signature. Five different rooms, if we cannot ensure unique signature, five different rooms have the, so, when uh, some uh, signature is seen, the operator would not know which one of these five rooms is on fire, which one of these five rooms is on fire. So they may have to send somebody to these five rooms. So these are what we call ambiguous uh, situations. Thus one cannot distinguish between these five. Now, if we can minimize the size of this ambiguous set, that will be better. Instead of having a scenario where five uh, rooms have the same signature, if it's split up into three rooms having one signature and two rooms have a different signature, that situation will be better than five rooms having the same signature. If five rooms have the same signature, five people may have to go to in five different rooms to find out which one is on fire. If three and two, either the three ones will be identified as having a room or two one is, a, if it is two, only two people need to go and examine that. If this three, only three people need to go and examine which room is on fire. So, Minimizing the size of this ambiguous set could be also a reasonable objective, which we are basically working on right now. Okay, so with that, let me stop here. And if you have any questions or comments, I'll try to answer your questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron, for this beautiful presentation. It's, it's indeed a very complex problem, a difficult problem, and you approached with let's say a tangible solution. 
Okay, let's see if we have any questions, remarks, suggestions from the audience. No? In my understanding, your solution has several uh, domains that can be applied. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, we have Which used, is, as I mentioned, criminal Like monitoring networks. in general. Exactly, monitoring in general, monitoring in general. So whatever you're trying to monitor. <laughs> Exactly. Let's say position in cameras in uh, the urban space or absolutely. See, we have we have used it detectors. in satellites. Yes, we have used in satellites. We have used in electric power grids. We have used in criminal network monitoring. We have used in sure. many many different domains. However, I, one question that I have is that if you have realized, let's say, the baseline or the optimal conditions for your solution how how big should be a network in order for your solution to be efficient and effective or how much money should we have in order to have let's say an efficient performance well see the thing is that uh, i mentioned about this budget thing see that if you give a large network okay if you give a large network let's say 5000 node network it could be and depending on the structure of the network how many uh, sensors will be needed how many sensors that depends on the structure of the network okay so as i mentioned that it could be as few as uh, log of n so if you have 5000 uh, node uh, network you might require very few actually you might require if the network has good structures if the network has bad structures then you might need more okay so in our case we got something around n by 3 n by 2 something like that n by 3 n by 2 so in the example that i showed we had a 10 node network and 4 was the least number of sensors that was needed to monitor all the nodes to have a unique signature uh, 4 to 10 which is uh, about 50 but little less than 50% little less than 50% okay now we also consider now if a large network let's say you need to deploy 2000 uh, sensors you may not have the budget to deploy 2000 sensors. Let's say you are able to deploy 1,500 sensors. We also consider that situation, that is exactly what we had talked about here in the budget constrained environment. What are the things that you can do with the resources that you have? You can deploy 1,500 sensors. Where should you deploy them to derive the maximum benefit out of these uh, 1,500 sensors that you can deploy? All right. Perhaps then your idea could become a guideline or uh, or a base document that can uh, contribute the architects in order to optimally design their networks, in order to be effectively and efficiently be monitored with your algorithm, I would say, with the minimum am amount of sensors, the right. minimum amount of uh, devices. Yeah, I think that's a very good suggestion. We never thought about that. So basically what we have been thinking about that the design has already been done, where should we deploy the sensors? What you seem to be saying that if I design it this way, I require fewer number of sensors. Exactly. Okay. That makes sense. It could be a really useful document for yeah, architects yeah, yeah. in the future. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Perhaps I, you can uh, exchange some ideas for utilizing your, your approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a thank you so much. I just said that I we never thought about. We thought the design is already given. We are trying to figure out what is the best we can do. Excellent, excellent, Arun. We will follow up. All right. All right. That okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, uh, colleagues, I think we are done at this stage. I don't know if uh, Arun could give us the floor back. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, I don't know if uh, the participants could uh, switch on their cameras in order to take a family photo. And I could share it with you if you are already here and you have not uh, become so tired after all these presentations, which in my understanding were really useful this year. Mm -hmm. So how about the rest? Marco, are you here? Lionel, Maria, okay. I will take this photo and share it with you as soon as possible. Okay. Once more. So let's say cheers. Cheers.
Okay, I got it. And I also have for you, let's say a brief poll to conclude on, on some things. Actually on our future steps, I will share it with you in this on my screen and the link too. Just give me one second, please. Okay, here it is on the chat. And I will share it with you too. Actually, these are two questions. The first one is your preference about the special issue. You can vote. I explained earlier that we have the option to develop a special issue for the ACMD.gov, which is free of charge. It's a good journal. Or the MDPI sustainability, which has uh, fees. However, it belongs in, uh, in Q1, if it's of uh, your preference. Just give me your, your guidance and I will follow up. I have contacted both the editors and they are interested, the editors in chief. One thing I was going to say is that uh, I'm not familiar with these. So whichever is considered to be more uh, prestigious or something, something along <laughs> those lines, maybe we should go with that. Okay, let's say that the DGOV has not yet an impact factor because it's a new journal, I see, but I see. it belongs to the ACM, which is really Yeah, yeah, the ACM by itself, by itself, I think it's a name that everybody knows about exactly. ACM. So yeah. The second one it belongs to quarter one, has a good impact factor, approximately four, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, for, it's open access, so it has a publication phase. So according to your preference, I will apply to the ACMD Go. Okay, okay. And I will follow up with uh, guidance about how you have you can develop your extended versions. Mm -hmm. So let's step forward to the second question. I, I labeled uh, a potential next year's topic that has to do with society number five, society version five. But of course, you can provide with us some alternatives, other suggestions that can become the basis, or we can combine with uh, local community number five. It's up to you. If you have any ideas that would be more than welcome and useful. Of course, these things deal with uh, society number five, but smart contracts, social innovation, labor market analytics. So I would suggest to stay tuned. Indeed, citizen engagement. Actually, citizen centricity is the main topic that appeared from this year's version. I will take a short of this contribution too, regardless of the fact that I, this has been recorded. Um, where are you? Here it is. Okay, and I have this too. I will include these topics in the next year's call. So next year. I'm not sure where next year WWW conference will take place. I think somewhere in the States. I don't know if Romain, Romain, do you have any idea? Has it been concluded? 
about the location on the, on the, of the next conference? Exactly. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I know a lot of this information. So. I think that it is going to take place in Austin, Texas, but okay, let's say. Yes, probably. Maybe I um, could have heard that, but I'm not sure it's confirmed. By the end of the conference, we will know for sure. By the end of the week. I hope that you will have the chance to attend some other events too. From our side, we are done. I, I hope that you found this year's workshop of your interest and it helped you out identifying, identifying new areas that you can work on. Perhaps you can be connected and explore other ideas too. I tried to set up some connections with all of you actually during this event. On behalf of my co-chairs, I would like to thank each of you and all of you together for being here, for contributing and transforming our workshop to a, a valuable place, regardless of the fact that it is still a virtual place. I hope next year we will meet in person. And uh, to encourage you, stay tuned, stay connected to each other and develop other ideas, increase our awareness in these domains, and uh, wish all of you good luck, stay healthy, stay happy, and stay productive, at least that productive. Yeah, on behalf of the participants, I would like to thank you and the other organization, organizers for this workshop. I think it's a very interesting and useful work, uh, workshop for people who are working in this domain. Now you are asking about the location where next year's uh, conference is going to be. So actually I was just curious as to this year's conference is supposed to be in Lyon, right? Lyon, France. Yes, it is. How many of us participated from Lyon? My guess is probably zero, right? Actually, I am in Lyon right now. Oh, you are okay. So you are probably you are the only one from Lyon. Okay, you are the only one from Lyon. <laughs> so, so this place becomes very oh, I don't know. It's not that important anymore. The way things are going, people can participate from any part of the world. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. We have transformed uh, the yeah. conferences to hybrid or to fully virtual. Right. But right. you know, sometimes the time zone uh, is, yeah, is useful, yeah. like in your case. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And of course, if uh, the physical um, and face-to-face uh, -face meeting will be available, it also increases the potential of, uh, of each event, of each workshop. It's always different. And in many cases, it is very attractive. Always yes, face-to-face -face is around. definitely more attractive than going through this uh, web-based uh, meetings and all that. So actually, I was going to say about this space, not only space is an issue, time is also in the issue <laughs> in the sense. Absolutely. I'm, I'm just <laughs> going to tell you something that is, I'm organizing a workshop that's supposed to take place uh, early May in New York City. Our keynote speaker, he works in Japan. He works in Japan, so we had to adjust our times to make sure that it doesn't become a very weird, strange time in Japan. But it just turns out during the day of the workshop, he will be in New York City. So he's traveling to New York for some other part of us. <laughs> so all our timings uh, were basically went haywire because people, he started traveling. So all these type of issues you don't encounter if you say you have to come to Leo sure. for these few days. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> <laughs> These anyway, things are always funny and useful. <laughs> yeah. So once okay. again, thank you everybody for being here with us. Enjoy the rest of the day and hope to meet you soon and in person. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Enjoy. Bye.